Hello, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, and fellow advocates of democracy. It is my great, great pleasure to welcome you to this year's International Democracy Day event. Today, we come together not just as participants, but as passionate advocates of a cause that lies at the core of our shared global vision, the cause of democracy. Your presence here signifies your commitment to upholding the principles of democracy, and we are sincerely honored to have you with us. Before we embark in this enlightening journey of discussions and insights, I would like to express our heartfelt gratitude to International IDEA, the permanent mission of the government of Costa Rica at the United Nations, and the dedicated partners of the Global Democracy Coalition for hosting this event. As someone fortunate to work with this organization, I can attest that their dedication to promoting democracy and their unwavering support in organizing this gathering is a testament to the importance of collaborative efforts in advancing the democratic cause. We are privileged to stand alongside them in, celebra in celebrating democracy's enduring spirit. Today, we come together on a day of great significance, International Democracy Day. It's a day that transcends borders and ideologies, reminding us of the fundamental values that underpin our societies. As we celebrate the achievements of democracy and reflect on the challenges it faces, we acknowledge that our work is far from complete. This event serves as a platform to deepen our understanding of democracy's role in achieving the sustainable development goals and aspires to ignite meaningful conversations that will drive our efforts forward. But before I continue, allow me to introduce myself. I am Elisenda Valleste Bouchot, the coordinator of the Global Democracy Coalition, and I am truly humbled to serve you as the master of ceremonies. My role today is to ensure that this event unfolds seamlessly, guiding you through our discussions, introducing our esteemed guests, and maintaining energy and flow of our conversations. It's an honor to be your host, and I look forward to a morning feel of enlightenment, inspiration, and meaningful exchanges. Our agenda has been thoughtfully crafted to delve into the intricate relationship between inclusive democracy and sustainable development. We will begin with the introductory remarks to set the stage for our discussion. Following this, we have two panel discussions, each addressing key aspects of democracy and its impact on society. In between, we have dynamic lighting talks that will provide diverse perspectives. Throughout the event, we strongly encourage active participation and eagerly await a vibrant Q&A session. Finally, our closing remarks will summarize our key takeaways and emphasize the profound importance of our continued efforts to strengthen democracy on a global scale. So without further delay, let's start. We are truly fortunate to have a distinguished figure who embodies the ideals we hold dear. Dr. Annika Silva Leander will deliver our opening remarks. Dr. Silva Leander is the head of the North America Office of International IDEA, but she also serves as International IDEA's permanent observer to the United Nations. She champions democracy at the UN General Assembly and other global forums. Dr. Silva Leander is an opinion leader on democracy, contributing through analysis and speaking engagements on the state of democracy, particularly within the UN and other pertinent international contexts. Her prior roles include leading the Democracy Assessment Unit at International IDEA in Stockholm, overseeing the Global State of Democracy Report and the Global State of Democracy Indices. Dr. Silva Leandra's expertise and dedication to the cause of democracy have been instrumental in shaping the narrative of democracy on the global stage. Her insights will undoubtedly provide us with valuable context and inspiration and as we explore the intricate interplay with democracy, inclusivity, and sustainable development. Dr. Silva Leander, we are eager to hear your thoughts and profoundly grateful for your presence. Good morning, everyone, and warm welcome to this event celebrating International Democracy Day here at the UN. We could not find a more symbolic place to hold this event, as International Democracy Day was proclaimed by the UN for the first time 16 years ago with the purpose of promoting and upholding the principles of democracy throughout the world. 
In doing so, the UN invited all member states, civil society organizations, and other stakeholders to commemorate this day by using it to raise public awareness about the importance and the value of democracy. And this is particularly important at this moment in time, when democracy and democratic values are being challenged in many parts of the world. These concerning trends are both driven by an impact on countries' abilities to deliver well-being, sustainable development, and inclusive growth to their citizens. Ultimately, democratic backsliding impacts on the ability of countries to deliver on the 2030 agenda. International IDEA is proud and honored to co-host this event in celebration of inclusive democracy here at the UN, together with many of our partners in the Global Democracy Coalition in collaboration with UN and International IDEA member states. For International IDEA, this day is the most important of all UN days because our mandate as uh, an inst international organization is to support, advance, and strengthen democracy around the world. And we are a unique intergovernmental organization in that regard, as our 34 member states, democracies from across the world, have committed to democracy as a regime and as a set of values and principles in their own countries, but many also in collaboration with each other and others in the multilateral and international space. So we are here today to put the spotlight not just on democracy, but on the importance of inclusive democracy for the achievement of the 2030 agenda, an agenda where no one is left behind. Whether they are women or girls from indigenous communities, the LGBTQ plus community, people living with disabilities, migrants, refugees, young people, people living in poverty, religious, racial, linguistic and ethnic minorities, all these voices and others need a space within democratic systems as active participants, voters and decision makers. And we also know that too often these groups face unsurmountable barriers, both in newer and older democracies and not the least in non-democratic contexts, to make their voices heard, to participate in decision making and to actively engage in their societies. Democracy at its core is about representation, equality and the protection of individual rights. Yet in many parts of the world, countless individuals and communities still find themselves on the margins of these democratic processes, their voices stifled, their concerns ignored, and their rights denied. So first and foremost, we must recognize that democracy is not just about voting, but about participation and active societal engagement. The very essence of democracy hinges on the idea that every citizen should have the opportunity to influence the decisions that affect their lives. But when marginalized groups are excluded from this process, we undermine the very essence of democracy. By denying them a voice in decision making, we perpetuate a system that favors the privileged while neglecting the concerns and needs of the most vulnerable among us. Including marginalized groups in democratic processes is not just a matter of fairness, though. It is a matter of improving the quality of decisions as well. When we exclude voices from different backgrounds, experiences, and identities, we miss out on a wealth of knowledge and insights that could lead to better policies and more equitable solutions. Inclusion allows us to tap into the full potential of our collective intelligence. We also know that marginalized groups often bear the brunt of social, economic, and political inequalities. They are disproportionately affected by policies that fail to address and to consider their unique challenges and needs. And without their input, our democratic processes can perpetuate these disparities. So including marginalized groups in democratic processes also helps promote social cohesion and unity. When individuals and communities feel that their voices are heard and their interests are represented, they are more likely to trust the institutions of democracy. And inclusivity fosters a sense of belonging and shared responsibility, ultimately strengthening the bonds that hold our society together. So how can we ensure that marginalized groups are included in democratic processes? To do that, we must begin by dismantling the barriers that have historically excluded them. And this includes addressing issues like voter suppression, discriminatory electoral practices, and unequal access to education and information. We must also actively seek out and support candidates from marginalized backgrounds and create opportunities for their voices to be heard at all levels of government. In addition, civil society plays a crucial role in amplifying the voices of marginalized groups 
NGOs, community organizations, and advocacy groups serve as vital channels through which marginalized communities can express their concerns and mobilize for change. And so supporting these organizations and listening to the recommendations is an essential step towards a more inclusive democracy. In conclusion, including marginalized groups in democratic processes is not only a moral imperative, but it's also a practical necessity. So we will today hear from our speakers on the importance of including marginalized voices to ensure that inclusive democracy advances the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development through their own stories and experiences. And we are also co-hosting this event together with many of our partners in the Global Democracy Coalition, which is a unique multi-stakeholder coalition that was formed in 2021 to provide a space and a platform for civil society organizations, international institutions, academics, and others to discuss and exchange good practices and knowledge in democracy building and to engage in multilateral fora on democracy, initially around the summits for democracy. Costa Rica, that is co-hosting this event with us, is a valued uh, member state of International IDEA and of the UN that together with us and others have committed to advance inclusive democracy within its own borders but also in their region. So thank you Ambassador Chan for being with us here today. So is Canada and we are very honoured to have with us today former Prime Minister Campbell. Thank you for being partners with us on this journey of democracy. So we would like those of you here today, both those in the room and those that are listening in online, to come away from this event with a sense of hope, I, I hope. Yes, we are a long way away from an inclusive world where no one is left behind. There are many setbacks on the path to achieving the 2030 Agenda, as will be discussed next week at the SDG Summit. But we hope and just as we hope that the heads of state that are present uh, at the UN General Assembly next week will recommit to the goals set out in the 2030 Agenda with concrete actions and resources, we in this room and listening in from across the globe play a key role in raising awareness about the importance of building more inclusive society, putting pressure on governments to turn their words into action and support marginalized communities in making their voices heard. So, Happy International Democracy Day to all of you, and let the conversation begin. Thank you. Thank you so much, Annika, for your enlightening remarks. They have indeed provided a profound context as we start our discussions. Now we turn to our, our attention to uh, a lightning talk that has been thoughtfully prepared by our partners within the Global Democracy Coalition, the American-Russian Speaking Association for Civil and Human Rights. Joining us are Ms. Lyubov Stasiv, a former Uca Ukrainian member of parliament, and Dr. Dmitry Glinsky, the executive director of the American-Russian Speaking Association for Civil and Human Rights, both of whom also serve as co-chairs of the Ukrainian and Russian-American anti-war roundtables at the organization. They will be sharing their valuable insights, setting the tone for the first panel. Субтитры 
як нерівноправність між державами руйнує справедливість, підриває їхні інститути, віддаляє нас від досягнення цілей сталого розвитку. Включення української діаспори, зокрема біженців у роботу інститутів і форумів демократичних суспільств, зміцнює демократію. Наші спільні столи американців українського та російського походження, які протистоять кремлівській диктатурі та агресії – одна з ініціатив у цьому напрямку. Саме то он, що до цілий сталого розвитку, має звернути увагу на нерівноправність у її структурі. Адже установчі документи ООН сягають 80-річної давності, вони застаріли і потребують. We thank the Global Democracy Coalition for the honor of addressing you today. Connecting participation and inclusion with peace and justice has a special meaning for refugees and exiles from dictatorships and war. Russia and Syria, Venezuela and other autocrats have pushed millions abroad by persecution and fear. And in Ukraine, this was done by the Kremlin's barbaric aggression. All this sets us back on a path to sustainable developmental goals. Yet here is a paradox. The refugees are some of the most marginalized and excluded, and yet also some of the most influential change agents. From the earliest Greek tragedies to the sculptures of the present-day Chinese exile, Ai Weiwei, the refugee stands out as a key witness before the court of history, testifying about the social and moral norms of her native and her recipient country. And her testimony challenges the limitations of our democracies. Torah, the foundational book of Abrahamic religions, set as one of our developmental goals to treat the stranger the way we treat our own. Yet our strangers today keep facing high barriers to acceptance and inclusion even where decisions are being made about them. And even in New York, they may get demonized and at times silenced by the wealth and connections of those from whom they fled. I've seen this up close. And yet most of them keep contributing to their new societies in a multitude of ways. Most of them appreciate the difference between what they left behind and what they may eventually gain. And many have learned from experience that peace without justice for the victims and their victimizers will never last. They have higher stake than some of the more privileged groups in the success of the Summits for Democracy and the Global Democracy Coalition agenda as a joint counteroffensive against their oppressors. They are the natural allies for all those working to make our democracies more inclusive and resilient against autocratic and oligarchic challenges at home and abroad, giving them voice across our institutions starting with those that are supposed to help them would add strength to pro-democracy forces around the globe. Our association of refugees, exiles, and other migrants from former Soviet countries of Europe and Asia is proud to add to this effort. To amplify people's voices for a just peace that would make Ukraine whole, we've been bringing Ukrainian and Russian diaspora activists together for dialogue among themselves and whenever possible with global audiences like you here today. Thank you for listening. What an inspiring talk and a great way to introduce our first panel. This panel is dedicated to exploring the challenges faced by marginalized communities in accessing and participating in democratic processes. The panel will also emphasize strategies to address these barriers and foster inclusive democracy. Furthermore, it will shed light on the importance of gender equality, SDG 5, reduce inequalities, SDG 10, and the promotion of peace, justice, and strong institution, SDG 16, in shaping inclusive democratic processes. Through this exploration, our panel aims to deepen our understanding of how inclusive democracy can contribute to sustainable development and create a more equitable and just society. So allow me to introduce our distinguished moderator for the first panel, Mr. Musa Kondo, the executive director of the Sahel Institute. Ms. Kondo, a former special advisor to the president of Mali on governance, democracy, and the rule of law, is a renowned figure in the fields of journalism and civil society. With nearly two decades of experience in community development, particularly in engaging youth and promoting civil participation, he has made significant contributions to sustainable development. Mr. Kondo is the founder of the weekly newspaper L'Express de Mamako and has previously directed Accountability Lab in Mali. His commitment to fostering leadership, accountability, and integrity among youth has led to his placement in key positions within organizations like the World Bank, UNDP, and the International Organization for Migration. 
His influence extends beyond his home country as he chairs the APRM Youth Network and leads the Progressive African Network initiated by former president Olesegun Ovan Ovasanko from Nigeria. We are deeply honored to have him guide our discussion today. And I will also like to extend a warm welcome to our esteemed panelists who have generously joined us to share the insight and expertise in promoting inclusive democratic processes and citizen participation for peaceful and just societies. Their dedication to this cause is truly commendable and their diverse backgrounds will provide us with a multifaceted view of the challenges and solutions we face. Musa, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, I'm very pleased and, uh, and happy to be here uh, among you to talk about this uh, important topic on International Democracy Day. Uh, what is impacting the most my country uh, behind all and also many places around the world. Um, the panels uh, we have right now is, uh, uh, as uh, you said, mentioned right now on uh, inclusive, uh, promoting inclusive democratic uh, process and citizen participation uh, for peaceful and just societies. And uh, I'll be very honored to uh, introduce um, the panelists uh, here uh, with us, uh, starting with uh, 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 Her Excellency Ambassador uh, Marita Chan, permanent representative of uh, um, Costa Rica. Costa, permanent mission of Costa Rica to the UN, uh, a seasoned Costa Rican diplomat, become ambassador and permanent representative as you have uh, the document with you um, to the United uh, Nations in August 2022, making a history milestone as the first Costa Rican uh, woman in this role since her country joined the United Nations in 19. Uh, 45. So starting with the, uh, the question with, with about uh, the first question, how social norms and existing power structures contribute to the marginalization of uh, certain communities in democratic uh, processes and the what strategies can be employed to challenge and overcome these barriers related to uh, SDG uh, 10 with challenging social norms uh, uh, about uh, what we're trying to do co combining democracy and development also in terms of inclusivity. Uh, so, Ambassador. <laughs> I didn't know how to speak right away. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much and good morning to all of you. Today is the Independence Day of Costa Rica. And I'm delighted to be here of the International Day of Democracy because democracy is, just, it is not just a system of government, it's a way of life. That is the way that Costa Rica have chosen to live since we became a republic. Of the outset, so please, I would like to extend my gratitude to all of you in this audience. Your presence here today is a testament to your commitment to these vital issues, your questions and contributions will enrich our discussions. The topics we are, about, we are about to delve into, democracy, inclusivity, and sustainable development are not just buzzwords. They are the cornerstones of a better future for all, a world where we promise not to leave anyone behind. In a world comp that is facing complex challenges, and my country is no exception, dialogues like this are more than important, they are essential. We must emphasize that these discussions transcend national borders. Democracy, gender equality, and justice are global goals, and their attainment is intertwined with the collective actions of nations and societies, not to mention the United Nations as a whole. So here we are to, because we believe in the power of democracy to create a more equitable world, a world where no one is left behind. So I look forward to your insights, experiences, and strategies, and to hear from my panelists, fellow paladins. Together we can explore the ways to challenge the status quo, to smash patriarchy, empower marginalized voices, promote justice, peace, and sustainability. I thank you. Yeah. 
Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador. I just want to add before I move to the next uh, uh, panelist, Ambassador Chen is deeply engaged with the international and regional organization and civil society and uh, academia. She is a member of the International Advisor uh, Council at the International Peace Institute in New York and holds a leadership position in several UN agencies, uh, including Vice President of the uh, 2023 Executive Board of the United Nations Development Program, the United Nations Population Fund, and the United Nations Office for Project Services. Uh, she also presides uh, over the UNICEF ex uh, Executive Board in 2022, leading a significant field visit to Thailand before her current role, Ambassador Chen held various positions within Costa Rican missions in, the Uni in New York and Washington, D.C. She began her career as a senior speechwriter for the president of uh, Costa Rica. Thank you so much, Ambassador, for your first words. Uh, the next panelist uh, is Ms. Uh, Emilia uh, Saez Corosendo, Secretary General of the United, United Cities and Local Government, UCLG. Uh, Ms. Uh, Emilia Saez, I'm sure I'm pronouncing it, Correctly, <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, she's the Secretary General of the United States Cities and Local Government. She worked uh, with the international movement and local and regional government in different cities uh, capacities since 1997, leading the programs and initiatives on institutional capacity building, the participation of women in local decision making and decentralized cooperation. She played a critical role in setting up global task force for local and regional uh, government and uh, as followed and represented local and regional government in iconic international processes, uh, processes such as uh, the Rio and Beijing plus 20, as well as the climate agreement, the SDGs and the Habitat 3 and facilitated the contributions from local constituencies and the United Nations process. Uh, Ms. Emilia, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this uh, first question is like a global thought on uh, uh, the topic and also your, your first thought. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chair, for giving us the opportunity to, to be here uh, with you today. Thank you to International IDEA and to the Global Democracy Coalition and, and to the Ambassador of Costa Rica for the continued work that is being done in this very important topic. Happy International Democracy Day. Democracy is not perfect. No system is. And I, th I don't think it has ever meant to be very perfect because it needs to evolve. It actually works. It needs to evolve with us. And what we are facing today is how democracy is coming to be under stress. It's under stress because of the many complex emergencies that we are going through, but also under stress because democratic systems have forgotten part of the citizens. There are many groups that do not feel represented in our democratic systems, um, that do not trust the institutions, and that is leading uh, to big questioning of the system itself. It is tangible in any street, in any neighborhood around the world that uh, when people do identify with their surroundings, with their neighborhoods, with their reality, and how much trust they put in the institutions that represent these systems. And the danger that we are facing today is not only because of war or autocracy or, or climate change. It is because of the lack of trust that we have in those systems that we are questioning their foundations. We feel as organized constituency of local and regional governments around the globe that it is at local level where the basis of democracy need to be strengthened, constructed and ensured. And that is through the implementation of human rights and freedoms that we will be able to do that. But we will need to do it in a very tangible way addressing the needs of people and making them responsible as well for their own needs, but the needs of future generations. And, and this is the trick here. How do you actually do that? How do you um, 
create this environment of trust. You need to address the hate discourse that is there. It's very important. You need to evolve in the new situations. You need to uh, apply uh, new uh, democratic uh, architecture to a changing system where um, artificial intelligence um, is, is playing a very important role in the way that we perceive the world, in the way that we get information. But we also need to uh, actually apply very uh, tangible changes to our systems that are actually very outdated. It's also very difficult to update the local systems of democracy and the local architecture without taking into account the international architecture of decision making. Any citizen right now feels a bit citizen of the world. They can buy anything, anywhere. Uh, they can, uh, they can um, experience the world through the eyes of others that are miles and miles away from themselves. It's, we, we feel what happens, the stress, the climate stress that happens in one part of the world affects directly in, into our day-to-day -day life. It's very difficult to detach the kind of decision that we'll need to address those challenges from the local decision. And so if we look at the state of, of democracy from that perspective, our architecture is very outdated and we cannot only deal with it at one single level. It will, be, it, it will need to be at multiple levels. But in this first round, I would like to share with you that while we know that the multiple crises are challenging our democratic systems because they are technocratizing decision making and are leading people to think that democracy might not be the efficient system to address uh, what we have, a very dangerous narrative. We also need to look at complex emergencies as triggers for democratic innovation and as motivations for citizens to become proactive agents for change. Look, tomorrow we start with the SDG Summit. The local and regional governments are going to meet here. There will be no democracy without empowered, educated, healthy people behind, behind the system. So we need to link these agendas there, and we think the local level is the place to do it. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, please. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for your, your first words. And these are exactly what uh, this conversation is all about, about uh, inclusivity, connectivity, and also how to make the new or uh, every voice like voice heard. And from the Sahel, I can definitely say how this is very important because it's not about speaking French, speaking English, or speaking uh, uh, the official language of the government to let or left some of the citizens behind. Because one day, the day they will start getting awake and aware about what's going on around them as the internet and all the things happening in the global village today as we are through the connectivity, they will start fighting for their right and will not be prepared for that. So thank you so much for mentioning that. Uh, I will just going to introduce my, uh, the next speaker. This is uh, uh, Mr. Uh, John Romano, director of uh, the TAP Network. Mr. Romano is the director of the TAP Network based in New York. Prior to joining the TAP Network, John worked as uh, at scale holder forum for a sustainable uh, future uh, and the Natural Resources Defense Council, coordinating global advocacy campaigning, campaigns around the United Nations post 2015 Sustainable Development Agenda. He also worked for the United Nations Secretariat with the UNDC's Division for Sustainable Development where he helped facilitate the engagement uh, of civil society in the Rio Plus 20 UN Conference on Sustainable Development and coordinated the UN social media uh, coverage for the conference. John has a MS in Sustainability Management from Columbia University and an MBA in Environmental Studies and Geography from Ohio West uh, Leyen University. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. John, for joining us. 
the first question is uh, the first, the global, you thought about the, the, the topic of the, the conference. Also, what do you think about the social norm existing uh, power structures contributing to marginalization of certain communities in democratic processes? Great. Uh, thanks very much, um, and um, yeah, thanks to the organizers of this uh, timely event. Uh, also, right in advance of the SDG Summit, where I think we might have some uh, democratic challenges, especially from the civil society side of things, and you know, accessing uh, some of these meetings. So we'll talk a little bit about um, uh, governance and uh, democracy on another level. Um, but I think one thing um, I wanted to mention. I mean, the question really here today uh, is how does governance uh, and inclusion and decision making, I think these terms are kind of uh, synonymous with one another, um, how does it contribute uh, to advancing progress towards the SDGs and the 2030 agenda? Um, you know, we've already heard that you know, the SDGs and the 2030 agenda are supposed to be people-centered and aiming to leave no one behind. So I think that's a, a critical question to unpack. I'm, I'm curious to hear um, actual experiences from, from all of you uh, on how that's happened in your own contexts um, as well. Um, but as a network, uh, the TAP network works on SDG 16, uh, or SDG 16 plus, as we refer to it. We refer to it as SDG 16 plus because we feel that uh, all of the issues contained within SDG 16, peace, justice, inclusion, the rule of law, human rights and fundamental freedoms, accountability, um, all of those issues are intertwined with the 2030 agenda. They act as enablers and outcomes of sustainable development. So for us, this uh, topic of uh, democracy and inclusive decision making hits uh, at the core of our work and at the core of our uh, over 400 uh, members uh, around the world. Um, I, I think I, I, I can't do justice to, no, no pun intended, I can't do justice uh, to expanding and, and uh, kind of taking on all of these uh, interlinkages, but I'll, I'll just mention a few things based on um, uh, some of the things that we've reflected on as a, as a network. Um, I mean, th I think very obviously inclusivity, uh, and I don't think I need to sell many people in this room on this, but inclusivity in decision making uh, helps foster more peaceful societies, um, especially in cases of conflict, um, either uh, within a country or between countries. Um, this, the resolution, the solution, really needs to be tailored uh, to appeal to the needs of all parties. Um, so ensuring that, uh, especially uh, citizen voices, um, the needs of citizens are reflected in conflict resolution at all levels, I think, is, is hugely uh, important. Um, democracies also are critical for ensuring that decision makers are representative of their populace. I think that's uh, also a given. And I, that's not to say that it's impossible for a governance system or re set of representatives um, that aren't necessarily representative of the populace. So that's not to say that it's impossible for them to take decisions that are in the best interest of their, um, their, their citizens. But I, I think, again, it goes without saying that people that have these lived experiences and know the realities on the ground uh, of different populations at different levels, I think is hugely important um, to contribute to the discussion, the dialogue, and the decision-making part of, uh, of democracies. Um, so ideally, uh, more representation or more equal representation is, uh, is ideal. I think one particular um, uh, statistic in this front um, is, uh, I think, pretty jarring. Um, one uh, global statistic is that 26% um, of women, uh, or 26% of total uh, parliamentarians in the world are women. Uh, and I think at this rate, uh, at the pace that we're going, we won't achieve gender parity in parliaments for another 80 years. Uh, and I think that's just not, uh, not, not good enough. Um, I think from, from our side, I, how do we think about ensuring that yes, in our democracies, we do have more representative decision making in, in, in addition to this inclusivity aspect of things. Um, I also wanted to th think a little bit about beyond democracy and democratic systems. Also think a little bit about um, what other ways there are to increase uh, inclusion aside from voting and, and representation and things like that. I think one example is around uh, participatory budgeting. 
Um, I think this is a really important aspect of the decision-making process, and you know, uh, um, they often say you can't measure political will, but I think you can, and it's usually through budgets. Um, it's a, a way to help citizens engage in a, a dialogue around what their priorities are and where money should be allocated within budgets, because policy commitments can really only go so far. We need um, budgets to back uh, things up. Uh, another example is around mobile court systems, and this has been particularly pioneered in, uh, in countries like Kenya that help increase access to justice systems to particularly rural areas, um, also provide um, support for around customary justice systems and helping citizens access um, uh, alternative dispute resolution mechanisms, um, civic justice needs, and, and, and the like. Um, and I think it's important for us to raise these examples because, uh, you know, I, I think it's, especially with uh, inclusivity and democratic systems under threat uh, these days, um, I think it's important for us to showcase and do a bit of storytelling of where are these inspiring and positive examples um, that governments and other institutions can aspire to. And, and how can we learn from um, colleagues um, um, like uh, Costa Rica, for example, who um, abolished um, their army, um, which has uh, really allowed them to focus more on the needs of citizens themselves. So how can we really learn from one another around our experiences and maybe some of the cases um, where we haven't necessarily done so well uh, and learn from that as well? So I'm, I'm particularly uh, intrigued to hear about your experiences and, and see how we can uh, learn um, within this community and, and obviously uh, a bit beyond there. But um, I'll, I'll stop there and um, contribute to the discussion. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Um, Mr. John, I'm turning now uh, to our panelists. Uh, the last not the least, uh, Ms. Regina Wolf, Senior Global Gender Advisor uh, at the International Foundation for Electoral Systems, IFES. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Regina serves as uh, the International Foundation for Electoral System IFES Senior Global Gender Advisor. She works closely uh, with the regional teams and field offices to implement IFES approach to gender equality and uh, women's empowerment uh, programming. She also uh, provides strategic uh, vision and leadership for IFES gender portfolio in outreach and partnership, technical advancement and innovation. Uh, technical assistant, quality uh, assurance, business development, and program design. Uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Forb, um, I'm sure I'm pronouncing it You're doing correct. Good. Oh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> has more than a decade uh, of experience in public service and advancing uh, the rights of marginalized uh, people in particular. And uh, uh, she has uh, championed gender equality issues and the right of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer people in her work. Park began her career with the federal government as a presidential uh, management fellow in the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, uh, and Labor at the US Department of State, uh, and went on to serve as the Obama Administration Director for Human Rights and Gender at the White House National Security Council, and as the Chief of Staff in the Secretary's Office of Global Women's Issues at the U.S. Department of State. Thank you so much, Ms. Regina, for joining us. So the question is the same, like uh, your, your, your thought on the, the topic, and also uh, I will just continue the conversation. Wonderful. Well, well, thank you so much um, to our, our esteemed moderator. Uh, obviously, thank you very much to International IDEA, um, the permanent mission of Costa Rica uh, to the United Nations, and happy Independence Day to, to our colleague, Madam Ambassador. Um, and, and thank you very much to the Global Democracy Coalition for the kind invitation to be here and for hosting this, this really important discussion. I'm, I'm really honored to be part of such an esteemed uh, panel of experts. Um, I, I was going to talk a little bit, uh, maybe more specifically, about kind of the SDG 5 um, and the gender um, elements of that. So I think kind of I'll, I'll maybe start from, from the, the principle and the premise that gender equality and democracy are, are both fundamentally linked and mutually mm -hmm. reinforcing, right? We, you cannot have true democracy um, without the equal and meaningful participation and leadership of women and girls. And of course, SDG 5 has charged us to achieve gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls by 2030, um, which you know, we've got some significant work to do. 
And I think it's really just the latest, perhaps, in a long list of international commitments that, that our governments have made um, to achieving gender equality, uh, particularly with respect to women's participation in political and public life. And these include you know, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, they include CEDAW, they include the ICCPR, um, not to mention you know, any number of, of regional instruments, national laws, and constitutions. Um, so not only is kind of achieving gender equality a matter of fulfilling international commitments and realizing human rights, it's also fundamental to good governance. Um, and we have any number of studies that show us that decisions are perceived as more legitimate when they are made by groups that represent society more broadly. And so you're seeing this fundamental link between, between representation, between inclusivity and democracy. Um, and that really underscores the need for wider representation in decision making. If you have women, for example, as 50% of the population, and often, often more than 50% in many countries, we should have women as 50% of our uh, leadership bodies. And that just underscores the need for wider representation in decision making as a key factor in government accountability. Um, and there's also just from maybe a, a practical standpoint, there is a significant body of evidence to suggest that countries led by women are, are home to better social and economic conditions and that the presence of women leaders in national, local, and community level governments leads to an increase in policy making that advances rights and promotes equality and improves the quality of life for those um, overlooked in society. So maybe I'll just stop there. I, we can have a, a discussion about how we can further emphasize these inter this interchange between gender equality and democracy, and what are some of the more specific um, tactics to actually increase women's representation in political bodies. But for my opening remarks, maybe I'll, I'll pause here and, and we can go on with the conversation. Uh, th thank you so much for uh, this, uh, your first words about uh, this AGG uh, 5. So I would just stay with you sure. with, uh, with a quick question about, <laughs> about the same, uh, in the same line. Um, so what actions can be taken, I mean, uh, to ensure the equal representation and meaningful participation of women in decision, in decision arenas? So, I mean, I think, you know, we, you know, the 2030 agenda, 2030 is rapidly approaching. I think John um, took one of, my, one of my stats that I often use that women are at, you know, 25, 26% of, of parliamentarians globally. Um, and I, I think the stats that I've heard in terms of women's political representation are even a bit grimmer. I've heard something like between 130 and 145 years of general um, representation, general parity in representative bodies. So that is going to take some concerted work by not just everybody in this room, not just all of the organizations that we represent, but the international community writ large. And so when we're thinking about, because I don't think any of us want to wait that long to achieve a gender equality in, represent, in representative bodies, I think of this really as both a supply issue and, dem and a demand issue, right? And on the supply side, I think the supply is everywhere, right? It's perhaps overwhelming the number of women and girls who are already leading within their communities or have the potential to do so, or are already leaders and maybe just don't recognize themselves as such. Um, they may need support. They may need encouragement. Um, they may, may need some specific skill building, for example. They may need access to information, access to that opportunity. But all of that capability, all of that raw material, all of that, very often that ambition to be a leader is there, right? So we're not lacking for talent in these spaces. There are plenty of women, there are plenty of young women, there are plenty of girls who are ready to raise their hands and take their, their seat in a leadership role. So I think the demand side is really where we all need to work. And I know many of our organizations are working on the kind of capacity building side for women and girls. My organization, IFIS, does that, um, largely working with government institutions, independent institutions like electoral bodies, electoral management bodies, political parties, those types of things. Um, but I think the demand side is very important because we have to support the environments in which these highly capable and highly capacitated women and girls are seeking to engage, right? Because otherwise, we're setting up women and providing them with training and providing them with, with um, information and, and technical assistance and empowering them to engage. And I don't want us to be empowering them to just run faster into a brick wall, right? I want them to be able to actually move forward. 
Um, and this really often means working to improve the legislative envi and political environment that they're entering. And there's a number of ways we've been doing this for a while. And that can be, you know, measures such as, you know, increasing the adoption. And I, I think the sincere implementation of things like quotas and temporary special measures um, and the enforcement of those, those mechanisms as well. It's not enough to have them on paper. They have to be um, out, out there in the world and actually, and actually enforced. Engaging political parties to actively recruit and support women candidates at all levels. Um, strengthening laws against gender-based violence online and off, and we're seeing more and more this intimidation and violence against women online in particular. And specifically, legislating to address political and electoral violence against women. And a number of countries have, have done that, have put those laws on the books to make political violence against women on the basis of gender a specific crime. Um, and then I think just the last, the last piece of this is really this requires a cultural change in, in the societies in which we all live, which are largely kind of based in this, this patriarchal attitude, um, and one that is often, unfortunately, openly hostile to women and girls raising their voices. That's just true. So we need to be working with, and IFAS works with men and boys to be better prepared to serve as allies and upstanders to the women and girls in their homes and in their communities, their schools and their workplaces, in governments, so that when women and girls raise their hands and their voices, they're not immediately overwhelmed by a deluge of hostility and harassment and even violence. Because once that happens, why would you want to stand back up again? Um, so, for example, when IFAS does work through our women's leadership programming, which we're, you know, we provide both kind of hard and soft skills, negotiation, um, budgeting, how to get involved in various electoral and political processes, who are working to train women so that they are best prepared to step up and step into these roles when they have the opportunity. Um, but we also work with the men in their environment, so in their families sometimes, in their communities, in their workplaces, in government, um, through an Allies for Equality program, so that those men are actually ready to be supportive to women when they come in and step, step forward as leaders. So I think having both of those things is incredibly important, because otherwise, We've seen time and again that when women assume a leadership role, often they also experience a backlash in terms of violence and harassment. And men, the men and, um, need to be prepared to help um, step in as supporters. So we like to give them actual concrete tools and reasons to do that. So I'll stop there and, and let us move forward with the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, this input and uh, really interesting ones. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, the, the point you just mentioned, sometimes it's uh, uh, they, the places, uh, I'll just put fingers, my, my own country, Mali, where uh, at a certain moment, they, uh, the National Assembly voted a law uh, to oblige like every single political parties and uh, civil society organization in terms of uh, position and certain uh, thing concerning a quota. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, if you want to be implemented or whatever, run for a poll, you have to pay 30% of women uh, represent a gender representative uh, in this uh, in this league. So, from moving forward, could go, why not 40% uh, or yes. uh, and up? So, thank you so much for uh, the work you're doing. Thank you so much. So, uh, I will turn right to my right, uh, Ambassador, um, about the inclusivity, uh, inclusion and also the marginalization of uh, certain communities. What strategies can be uh, uh, developed or employed to challenge and overcome uh, these barriers? Wow. Okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, we talk about social norms and existing power structures uh, okay. contribute to the marginalizations. Okay. So now what uh, strategies uh, can be employed um, to challenge this, um, to challenge and overcome uh, these barriers related to SDG uh, 10? Uh, thank you very much. I, we just heard about the issue of quotas, and quotas have helped. But quotas need to translate into actual power and a voice at the table, and, and, those, and that it's not about having enough women in the room. It's not making sure that we have half of the women participating in a panel. Is ensuring that their voices and their concerns are reflected in the final text of our uh, endeavors. Um, affirmative actions and quotas have helped. For instance, in Costa Rica, we started with a quota system in the 1990s, 1996 or 1998. 
uh, with a 40% quota of participation of women in government. Um, then we made an amendment requiring full 50% of representation among candidates in 2009. And most recently, um, whenever we have a president in the last two governments, they have announced gender party uh, as a norm, the, the party in, in the cabinet. But the problem, to be honest, is not only a, in, at the national level. Let me bring this issue here to the United States. At the end of the term of the current Secretary General, for 80 consecutive years, the UN will be um, ruled or headed by a medal at the top. Um, it's 80 years, and this problem begins since the UN Charter um, that states that he shall be the Chief Administrator Officer of the United Nations. This error is also compounded in Resolution 11 of 1946, which states that the Secretary General will be a man of high eminence, a man of high eminence. We judge policies not for the intentions. We, just, we, just, we judge policies by the results, and the results so far have always and exclusively produced a man at the helm of the United Nations. And it took 77 years after Costa Rica signed the UN Charter to appoint the first female permanent representative to the United Nations. And one of the first steps I, I took when I, I assumed this position was to recognize the role of uh, of Deputy Permanent Representative of Costa Rica who served for 30 years as deputy, a woman, and she was never considered as the permanent representative. So these social norms are everywhere, even in this organization that proclaims to champion SDG 5. And yet you should see the resistance we have when we call for a female to lead the organization because the bar for a woman is even higher. She must be fluent in these languages. She must have these positions. And there are plenty of women all over the world who can take on this job. So um, this road has not been easy. And, and, and we will continue to strive because the social norms are everywhere. They are in our communities asking women to take care of children and the care economy, which is unrecognized and paid for. It's in our families, it's in our own societies, and sometimes at the structural level in the most important organization in the whole world. So yes, we have taken steps, not only in Costa Rica with the gender quotas, but in this government, we have appointed more female ambassadors than ever before, more career ambassadors. We show that we have intentionally taken steps to break these, these social norms and shift the paradigm that is required to acknowledge that 50% of the population do, does require a seat at the table, a voice, and, and, and the opportunity to lead because if we want to change the world, we need to lead. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, pointing in this. So uh, I'm turning to uh, Emilia with uh, I will a little bit reframe the, the question, but in the same line, uh, what action can be taken to ensure the equality representation? Uh, talking about uh, inclusive democratic processes, to contribute advancing gender equality and uh, uh, the participation of women in decision making. Well, thank you very much. What an interesting discussion. Um, I think that that is not about gender equality that we're talking about. I think it's equality in general. And, and we need to address gender equality in particular because that is clearly a big failure of our civilization and, and, and our, and our uh, societies. Um, 
one of the important things that I would like to, to bring to this discussion is that it's not, we all think, oh, it's, it's another 100 years before we reach equality. It might be much longer, actually, <laughs> because, because it's not a lineal increase. I mean, in, in, some, in some places, we're going backwards. I mean, in some places, uh, we, ha we have seen the numbers going from 25% parliamentarians to 19% parliamentarians. In some places, we have seen the data going from 10% uh, mayor, uh, female mayors to 5% female mayors, which is the average. And so I, I think it is important to, to, to take that in, in, into, this, into this slide. I think in, in order to... Um, to have equality, you need to have women in political decision making. Because if you don't have women in political decision making, the structures of the decisions and the type of service provision will not lead for a new type of society where women can, can play a role, and where they are truly empowered, and where they are acting as equals. And that is also true for LGBTQ communities, for the, access, uh, for the uh, disabled community uh, with accessibility laws, and for migrants. Mm -hmm. And those are parts of the structures that we need to change. When we say at the local level that the system of democracy uh, and some of the governance uh, architecture is obsolete, we mean that you have migrants all over the world that kind of exercise the right to vote. And so if we are going for a representative system, it will be very difficult for them to identify with whatever outcomes of those elections are. Uh, you have, you have um, groups with a specific needs that do not identify with the decisions that are being made. And so the local service provision that is, uh, that, that is um, uh, facilitated by the, uh, by the institutions um, are solutions that they also don't identify with. So what do you need to do for equality in general, uh, women in particular? You need, you need to empower them, you need to educate them, uh, you need to make sure that there is a feminist approach to, uh, to decision making. And when I say a feminist approach, this is, uh, this is for men and women alike, for girls and boys alike, until we don't conceive leadership as a different type of endeavor than we consider it now. Leadership is not about power, but about uh, uh, inclusive decision making. We will not be making these, uh, these changes. And, and we feel it needs to happen at, at neighborhood level with councils of women, with councils of young people, with councils for a, a LGBTIQ uh, uh, community, etc., cetera, where, um, where these groups are able to define the kind of policies that they need in the society uh, that we are. The, the ambassador was saying democracy is, is not a system, it's a way of life. And if we want to do that, we will need everyone on board. But let us keep in mind, uh, not every woman decision maker is a feminist, and not every woman that is there is making decisions in favor of women and the most vulnerable groups, and that's okay because men have done this for hundreds of years, so women, those voices also need to be there, but we need to focus on the, on the quality of the equality. Thanks. You said it, the quality of equality. Thank you so much. Um, as John, uh, I'm turning to you. You mentioned about a different aspect uh, to strengthen uh, democracy in terms of uh, uh, way of life and also the budget, the participation and uh, inclusivity. I will just add also about the social justice. And um, I've seen a lot of uh, uh, developing, I would say, democracy are facing a lot of challenges right now, uh, including the Sahel region where I'm from, Mali. This couple of uh, last three years, we had like six military coups, just to say how uh, democracy is challenged and how people are struggling to find their ways uh, to make the democracy. And what could be the role of uh, uh, certain established and developed democracy uh, to system? Because it's all about defending values uh, behind the words, because democracy and how we, we feel it and how we live it, the ambition also is about a population to have people leading uh, the destiny to be able to solve problems and also anticipate in future 
challenges uh, towards the, the context or towards the countries. So we've seen a lot of authoritarian also regime pushing towards these countries to say this is not the good norms and here is another options you can look at and you can get your, your way out because the way things, corruption and also social injustice, because when we talk about social uh, justice and injustice, is about frustration. And the day these frustrations decide to come up, we cannot control, and it could lead to any kind of uh, thing. So what do you think uh, could be the role of uh, engaged citizens uh, to understand their right to be, to participate, and also to get their voices heard? Because it's not just to be to participate, but how to get your voices heard, whatever it is uh, in the process, uh, line to the, uh, SDG uh, 16. Great, yeah, I think those are really uh, important questions for us to think uh, about. And um, I think, yeah, I mean, even thinking, I mean, I know it's, um, it seems like an eternity ago now um, after COVID, but thinking back to 2019 and 2020 even, um, if you remember, um, that was a period where we had quite a bit of um, social unrest and, and protest movements. Um, I think in all regions of the world for many different reasons, but I think the underlying root cause of those uh, of that discontent was uh, a lack of um, social, uh, a feeling a lack of social justice. And I think w when we come to the SDGs and you know, um, you know, governments report on their progress towards the SDGs and say, yes, okay, we're doing well, A, B, C areas. Um, I think in a lot of ways, uh, it's important for us to think about how people feel or experience that progress. So administrative data, the data that governments are saying, these are the things that we are doing, is, is great. Uh, pro any progress is good progress. But I think it's important for us to think about how we ensure that people actually feel connected to uh, those institutions, uh, the, the policies. Uh, and, and again, goes back to that question about the, the trust uh, and, and trust being a fundamental aspect of a functioning democracy. I think when people feel like their government or their institutions aren't delivering for them, in a democracy, they have the right to protest. And I think that's a really amazing thing. But I think we also have to think a little bit about the situations where, or the governments or the, um, you know, the, the people that live in undemocratic states or in uh, authoritarian uh, cases. And I think this is a really, I don't have the answer for this, um, um, but it's an important question for us to think about. Because um, I think, um, so according to the, the um, uh, Civicus Monitor, only 3.2% 3 per, 3 of people live in 38 countries where civic space is, is open. And 28% of people around the world live in 27 countries with closed civic space and restrictions. So I think it's really important for us to think about, yeah, what is the role of uh, champions of democracy in helping some of those colleagues, a lot of civil society partners in those countries that are experiencing oppression. They are um, uh, um, either jailed or even killed in many cases just for speaking their mind or criticizing the government. I think it's really important um, to identify champions you know, like um, Costa Rica, like others, others um, uh, in this space. Uh, to really showcase the examples, the positive and inspiring examples, again, going back to this uh, showcasing of champions. Uh, as was said before, I think Amelia mentioned that democracy is not perfect and it's not meant to be perfect. And I think that sometimes lends uh, uh, a little bit of an open, opening for um, criti critics of, of democracy to say, look, this doesn't work in all cases. Um, and I think it's important for us to showcase the, the positive examples to say it's not perfect. Democracy uh, and this work is difficult, but here are some really shining examples of where it's been done, where it's been done well, and it can be done in other cases. Um, and I think one final thing, just to, to think a little bit about that, um, the social justice and um, protest movements, thing, things like that. I think it's also important to think a little bit about how we engage young people as well. Um, I think obviously it doesn't need to be said that young people do uh, need to play a, a much larger role in our democracies uh, and decision making. Um, and uh, I think inherently, um, 
young people may have a more long-term uh, perspective uh, when it comes to policymaking, because a lot of the decisions made today will impact their futures most of all. So I think a key question is, how do we get young people more involved uh, in uh, policy, uh, or more young people in, involved in community-based work, or even in leadership uh, opportunities? Uh, I think uh, another key question for us to, to kind of think about, um, how do we do that? Uh, and and uh, again, obviously, um, super interested to hear from, from others here on experiences on, on all of these fronts as well. Thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> promoting inclusive uh, democratic processes require us to have a very inclusive conversation also. So beside the panel, I'm uh, turning to the audience, the ones who may have questions uh, for the panelists. I'll be very happy and pleased to, to answer. Uh, yes, please. Oh, how is functions? Well, in primer lugar, first of all, to uh, the ambassador of Costa Rica, wish you a very good day to our uh, brotherly republic. Uh, it's an excellent opportunity for giving uh, so much visibility to the important issues we're discussing today. I was listening to the panel, and I congratulate uh, you all. I heard a lot. Uh, gender equality, uh, environment of trust, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, healthy and educated people, democracy, and uh, equal representation, overcoming barriers, and democracy as a way of life. I hear... Uh, represent two hats. I represent the Congress of the Republic of Argentina and also the International Federation of, uh, of uh, Libraries and Bookstores. I didn't hear the magic word, which was libraries. This is a magic word, libraries. I would like uh, to uh, say that 80% uh, of our sector is uh, made up of women, and these are women that represent their gender. Libraries are safe places. They are secure uh, spaces. They are places where people can meet, where there is protection, when democracies are struggling. In my specific case, I come from Argentina, where we had, where we are celebrating uh, uh, 40 years of democracy. We came out of uh, awful uh, military uh, coups, and the safest spaces for democracy are libraries. And that's what I wanted to say. There are many people that say that uh, there is no future for libraries because of artificial intelligence and so on. But this is totally misguided. Bib libraries are uh, safe and secure where places where you can go to find the real answers. And so what I want to say to the panel is simply, uh, what I want to ask you is, what do you think about libraries as a space for democracy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, who else want to ask a question? And uh, mm -hmm. please, if you can just be a little uh, brief and ask the question and introducing yourself, please, uh, so we can get time for more uh, people and our panelists to interact. Is that another question? Okay, please. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, moderator. I will make a comment. I'm the DPR of Chile. I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you, Costa Rica, for inviting us to commemorate the democracy. It's very important. And the other organizers. Uh, in Chile, we are in full agreement with all the things that have been said here. We cannot emphasize enough the target of gender equality. You know, this is a key component for democracy. We talk about real democracy and inclusion. Uh, in Chile, we have introduced that in the electoral laws. So it's very practically applied. We are making progress. But also, we launched just last year uh, our feminist foreign policy, which includes this substantive participation of women in decision making. It's not just uh, to have women there. Uh, I would like to, to mention that inclusion in the terms of fighting poverty is fundamental as well. 
This is the big exclusion historically that we need to be aware, and this is the agenda 2030. This is a key component of democracy. And, you, and we know that pandemics you know, brought a lot of setbacks. And of course, human rights are fundamental for every minority, every group, respecting in its dignity. Everything is intertwined. And finally, the role of the youth, of course, is critical. You know, they will inherit the world. We are transmitting them the value. So my question is, I would like to have the comment from the panelists, and it's a bit related to what Argentina just said, the, the, the bibliotecas library, but the thing of, we perhaps need to take again civic formation, educación civica, this is key. You know, with the hate speech and with the disinformation in the world going around freely, we need to go back to the basics, which is to form the people on the basics of democracy and how fragile it is. Before we took it for granted, not anymore because there are many conceptions, misconceptions there. So I think that we should, uh, again, in the schools and in many places, to highlight the value, the importance of a civic formation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, for your contribution and, uh, and the point. Is there another point? Uh, OK, Madam, s'il vous plaît. OK, yes, Madam. Yes, I'm Lin Nguyen for Vietnam Democracy Center, a partner of Alliance for Vietnam's Democracy. How do free and fair elections impact on the advancement of democracy? Authoritarian and totalitarian uh, go down to the path of oppressing its people and destroying civil society. And the road to, to a sustainable partnership is when the partner shares our value in rule-based order. The partner should champion free and fair elections, including the free and fair nomination of candidates. We have adopted a scoreboard for free and fair elections for 47 criteria as a litmus test in the hope that the Tatarian society will inch toward and be closer to our shared values. As the Vietnamese regime become more authoritarian and repressive, the people's voice become marginalized. 95% do not have a voice. The actual barrier is the ruling regime. There is no gender equality, justice, or strong civil institutions. We look forward to working with you in advancing a democratic uh, Asia. My question again is, how do free and fair elections impact on the advancement of democracy? Okay, thank you for your question. Uh, due to time sensitivity, uh, I apologize. We just answered these questions. So, um, uh, yeah. Ambassador, please. Yeah. Muchísimas gracias a las dos preguntas. Thank you very much uh, for all of these uh, questions that we had for, from Argentina and Chile. In English for the rest of you. Um, Thank you. I usually tell my delegates that excellence is a lifestyle, same as democracy. And excellence in the United Nations and for a United Nations delegate is it's, um, portrayed by the quality of their writing and the quality of the writing is a direct consequence of the quality of the reading. And, and I, it's no surprise that books are burned when crises come and when humanity is facing the worst times. So I appreciate that you mentioned libraries and, 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 and books as a reference, as a key, as a beacon of democracy, of showing that democracy is fully functioning. Another point that I want to make is that democracy is fundamentally a political process that requires youth. A youth indifferent to politics, or annoyed by politics, or has given up with politics, is not enhancing the cause of democracy. On the contrary, such youth is actually ceding power to those who believe in war or conflict as a legitimate means to resolving um, what can be done on, uh, by dialogue uh, and, or at the negotiation table. 
So we need to pay attention not only to women and youth, to women and girls, but youth in general, because we're missing a crucial piece of the puzzle. And when we, youth is disenchanted with politics or annoyed with it, we, we do not know what will happen because the means, the quality of democracy might decrease because it's very easy to, to get to them through media, social media, uh, and ads, but not with ideas and proposals. And what makes democracy strong is strong institutions and strong public policies that can be sustained throughout time. So uh, that is my response to the first two gentlemen. I thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Ambassador, is, uh, yeah, please. Thank you, and I'm, I'm very keen to provide maybe a brief answer to all three questions, and I'll try to do so quickly. Um, so maybe on the first, with respect to libraries, I will answer perhaps not as a representative of IFAS and maybe just as a citizen of the United States, where we're seeing, a, honestly, a tremendous pushback in the availability of free information on all manner of topics, including issues related to women, including issues related to LGBTQI plus people. So I think we can't take for granted, and we shouldn't take for granted, that that freedom of information, which is available right now in so many libraries and so many school libraries, is going to be there forever. So I really appreciate you mentioning libraries as an important civic and democratic space, and I think we all need to just be aware um, that we need to have our, 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 we need to be ready to protect them as well, because we're seeing in the US at least that that is not a given for all of our, our state and local lawmakers, uh, which is of course very disappointing. And I think that does speak a little bit to our, our colleague from Chile uh, speaking about the importance of civic, civic education, and that's a big part of the work that IFAS tries to do around the world. And I think in addition to to bringing those, those concepts back into our school curriculums all around the world about what it means to be a citizen, what it means to, to live in a pluralistic society where there are multiple voices, multiple perspectives that we're, that we're honoring and respecting and how we have free dialogue and, and how we can make space um, for multiple identities. I think that's exceptionally important. And then in those places where perhaps we haven't yet done that, you know, for, for children all the way through, there's still this opportunity when we're trying to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to register to vote, for example, you have to sometimes go to people. Uh, you have to take that, that, those efforts out into the community to reach people in rural areas, to reach people who have been internally displaced within their countries. That requires effort as well. Um, so not just with voter registration and, and that type of information, but what does it mean to vote? What, are you, what, are you, what does it mean to be um, a, a citizen who's participating? What does it mean to go to a community forum? Um, and so that, that I think is, is exceptionally important. And then to the last point on you know, free and fair elections and the relationship to democracy, free and fair elections are of course an essential element for democracy, but elections are not democracy. It is entirely possible to have an election that looks good on paper that has nothing to do with the way that government, like on election day, right? Everybody can go and vote, maybe there's not any outward violence, um, outward restrictions in people casting their ballot, but if there have been restrictions in, in, at every moment leading up to who shows up on the ballot, what's the point of an election if you really only have one party? What's the, you know, we don't want to let a technically fair election or a technically um, competent election stand in for democracy and mask what is often significant democratic irregularities um, in the actual governance of, of a country. So just to say that democracy is much much, much more than free and fair elections. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I'm inviting uh, Ms. Emilia for uh, yeah, some questions. Yeah, I, I want to pick on, on that and also address uh, the three issues that, that have been raised. Um, um, democracy is not only about the elections, and uh, however important that component has, is indeed, but it is about co-creating a community Around, around democracy. And this is why the local level is so important. And also we consider libraries as part of that uh, public space. It's not only about the books in the library, but about the community that you create around the books. And when I was saying that for democratic system to, uh, to be sustainable, uh, we need to, to have informed 
and, and, and healthy people. Um, I, I was referring uh, uh, to, uh, to, this, to this indeed. But in the era of interconnected individualism, that, that we live, I think we will need to redefine what a democratic system implies. And redefining this will also need uh, to look at where our participatory democratic exercises have been failing because they have been treated a little bit as pilot projects, not included everywhere, uh, including everyone, not upscaled enough, and, and, and um, engaging only parts of the population. And, and I think in this redefinition of, of those exercises, we will find many answers on how people will embrace um, the, 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 the system or not. Um, and it will be responsibilities, indeed, of all of the public spaces and all of the uh, empowered civil society um, to actually also uh, challenge the, uh, the decision-making architecture about the type of policies that will need to be implemented. This is what democracy um, is about, and I think it links with uh, civic education, but about co-creation of not only policies, but also responsibilities. Thank you. Th thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm uh, inviting Mr. John, if you have a uh, thought about the questions. Sure, um, yeah, a lot's already been said, so I'll just um, provide a few um, quick thoughts. Um, uh, yeah, I think uh, on, the, on the libraries side of things, I mean, I think it's, it's really interesting, I mean, we talk also about the civic um, education side of things um, as well, and I think taking a look at the fundamental freedom, it's not just an access to information exercise, thinking about all of the fundamental freedoms uh, that are enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, SDG 16, uh, also in many constitutions uh, of governments. Um, I, I think uh, libraries can help facilitate and um, kind of project uh, all of those fundamental freedoms. It's not just that one, one aspect around access to information. Um, and I think one thing, um, you know, coming back to the, the other question about um, uh, the impact of, uh, of, of election, free and fair elections. I, I'm intrigued to learn more, maybe we can connect after this, about your own measurement of, um, you know, how you're assessing, um, uh, you know, elections and fundamental freedoms in, in your country. But I think the one thing this kind of reminds me or brings me back to is during the negotiations on uh, the SDGs in, in 2014 and 2015, uh, a lot of the pushback against SDG 16 was that uh, SDG, uh, the detractors said that uh, peace, justice, inclusion, human rights, that it couldn't be measured. Mm -hmm. And I think those of us in this room, those of us that work on these issues really deeply know that it's actually the opposite. There are many ways for us to measure inclusion and participation and justice and human rights. And I think if anything, I think that's the challenge on how do we zero in on, okay, this society or this government is inclusive or are they not? Because there are many ways to measure that. Um, and so I think <laughs> this is really important because I think most authoritarian governments, I would say, would, if you confront them and say, um, you are not inclusive uh, or you're not participatory or you are authoritarian, um, they would probably, uh, come back and say they aren't. So I think it's a question for us to think about the data and uh, the evidence base for this. How do we ensure that there are data points or uh, work that's being done um, to help us push back and say, this is where we need improvement. These are the countries that uh, citizens are left behind most frequently. And again, I mentioned the Civicus Monitor as just one example um, of, of efforts to do that. Uh, but I do think um, there is a role to play uh, from colleagues and partners here, champions here uh, at the UN, um, to help push back against some of those, uh, you know, the, the, the countries that might uh, say that they're being inclusive, uh, but may not be, and using some of that evidence base to kind of um, be the foundation of how we hold those governments accountable at the international level. Um, just another thing for us to think about going forward as another opportunity, how do we build a community that can help do that and support champions and partners to push back when it's needed. So uh, thank you so much, Is, uh, uh, Mr. John. Yeah.
So I invite you again to give a round of applause to our panelists. We are 11.30, unfortunately. This is a, a great conversation. We could continue continuously having a, a side. So my last word, and thanking you so much, say democracy requires balance in many spheres. And in functioning democracies, institutions are invested to protecting that equilibrium. So thank you so much for uh, being here. and. Uh, the audience for this uh, panel. Thank you so much. Good job. Thank you very oh, much. Thank you so much. Sorry. I'm going to let you. <laughs> Thank you so much to our panelists. Um, I will appreciate if we can change the panel as quickly as possible, as we are already a little bit late. Um, but uh, thank you so much to, to the panelists, to the participants who pose such provoking uh, questions and such powerful statements like democracy is not a system, is a way of life that Ambassador Chan uh, just mentioned. Your insights have sparked engaging discussions that will undoubtedly shape the future of democracy. So before I introduce our second panel, we have uh, another lightning talk lined up. This time, our partner, Westminster Foundation for Democracy, will set the stage for the second panel. So Ms. Cecilia Mancoyala, the head of practice and inclusion at WFD, will share some intriguing remarks that will encourage us to reflect on what lies ahead for the second panel. Thank you. Picture a famous political leader. Is it JFK? I don't mean literally, I mean does the leader share his characteristics? Are they from the economic and political elite, the dominant ethnic and religious group? Are they not too old, not too young, married? Are they a man? If not, thanks are due to the phenomenal woman whose existence shifted your idea of what leadership looks like. But she and you are for the most part anomalies. While these phenomenal people can change those images, they cannot on their own change the norms and resulting narratives that produce them. The dominant idea of political leadership is inextricable from masculinity, creating enormous barriers for women and non-binary people, particularly those who are minoritized and othered due to racism, classism, homophobia, transphobia, ableism, and religious intolerance. When someone overcomes these barriers that we place on them, they are often expected to change the very system that has excluded them for so long. That's not just unrealistic, it's unfair. And sometimes they just don't want to. Westminster Foundation for Democracy recently published a study on women's political leadership in Southeast Asia. It found, as is often the case around the world, women leaders primarily come from the wealthiest and most politically connected families. These privileged identities meant they could navigate, negotiate, or completely circumvent gender barriers. Several said that gender wasn't an issue on their relatively short route to leadership. And once there, they reported that they had little to no incentive to change the system likely because it had ultimately benefited them. Although the report is from Asia, elite systems reproduce themselves everywhere, and the findings are consistent with studies globally. Intersectionality means allowing for the plurality of stories that exist at once. The funding and political landscape don't make this easy, but if our efforts to widen access to power are not intersectional, nothing will change. In fact, we might be maintaining the inadequate status quo by reinforcing it with people who already have access to power and allowing them to be weaponized by those who resist change to distract from and even legitimize systemic inequalities in representation. 
It matters that each of us can see ourselves represented, but the emphasis on visible markers of identity is only about visibility, which is something, but not enough to achieve the substantive representation required to respond to the diversity of our life choices, needs, perspectives, and the identities that inform them. Our energy should be directed towards shifting and ultimately transforming the masculinized norms that shape political structures, cultures, and incentives. That means understanding the extent to which institutions, rather than individuals, can demonstrate substantive representation of the diverse communities that constitute the public. The ending we're seeking demands that our institutions tell and accommodate more and different stories, so we not only see ourselves in them, but so we can be every version of ourselves in the safety and freedoms that democracy promises us all. Well, indeed, Cecilia's remarks have provided valuable insights and served as a fitting introduction for our second panel. As we navigate our evolving global landscape, the influence of social norms on both democratic institutions and sustainable advance advancement remains undeniable. These unwritten societal rules can either catalyze or hinder the achievement of critical sustainable development goals. Therefore, it is essential to scrutinize these norms, particularly within the context of SDG 5, gender equality, SDG 10, reduced inequalities, and SDG 16, peace, justice, and strong institutions. So through this lens, we can better cultivate a global democracy that is truly inclusive and prepare us for enduring progress. This panel aims to spotlight these norms, challenge their continued relevance, and strive for a future where every voice resonates and community thrives. I just want to remind you that we have a Spanish uh, interpretation um, since one of our panelists is uh, Spanish speaking. But to introduce this panel, we are honored to have a special guest today, Ms. Pia Wonek, the CEO at DT Institute. Ms. Wonek is a seasoned leader in international development and humanitarian assistance, boasting two decades of experience in policy development, program design, and project management within the global nonprofit sector. Prior to joining DTI, she spent nearly 10 years at Global Communities, where she directed humanitarian responses and development projects in 24 countries, including Syria, Ukraine, Liberia, Gaza, Ethiopia, Guatemala, Kosovo, Honduras, Sri Lanka, and Yemen. Ms. Wanik began her career with USAID Office of U.S. Foreign Disaster Assistance, focusing on emergency response programs in East and Central Africa. Her ability to convene diverse stakeholders to address complex challenges is a hallmark of her career. Ms. Pia, the floor is yours. Thank you. Esteemed guests, today is a world that is constantly changing, evolving, and adapting. And in this shifting global landscape, one thing remains undeniable, the profound influence of social norms on both our democratic institutions and the pursuit of sustainable development. These unwritten societal rules often act as either catalysts or barriers to the achievement of the sustainable development goals. Today, I want to take a closer look at these norms, particularly in the context of three vital SDGs, Goal 5, Gender Equality, Goal 10, Reduced Inequalities, and Goal 16, Peace, Justice, and Strong Institutions. At the heart of this landscape are social norms, those unwritten, often subconscious rules that govern our behavior and decisions. Social norms are deeply ingrained in our societies and often dictate how we perceive the world and interact with one another. They act as powerful forces, either propelling us towards progress or holding us back. Social norms play a significant role in perpetrating gender inequality. From the workplace to our homes, they shape our perceptions of what is normal for those we identify as women, men and women. But we've seen how challenging these norms can lead to more inclusive and equal societies. And when we shirk gender stereotypes, we can empower individuals and create a world where everyone has access to the same opportunities. Social norms can either reinforce or challenge inequality. They often determine who has access to education, healthcare, and economic opportunities. And when we seek to challenge these norms, we inspire a more equitable society. 
In the realm of peace, justice, and strong institutions, social norms are crucial. Norms that promote tolerance, fairness, and the rule of law contribute to the stability of societies. Conversely, harmful norms can undermine institutions and perpetrate conflict. Transforming these norms is essential for building strong, just, and peaceful nations. In conclusion, understanding and challenging social norms are essential steps in fostering a more inclusive global democracy, a democracy where the voices of all citizens are heard regardless of their gender, race, or background, a democracy that values equality and justice as its core principles. It is within such a democracy that we can lay the foundation for enjoying growth and development. The commitment to supporting the development of more inclusive global democracy is one that we share at DT Institute. As an agile non-governmental organization and one of the Global Democracy Coalition Steering Committee members, DT Institute is first and foremost a peace and development organization driven by our commitment to improving the human condition. In the panel, we will delve deeper into these themes and explore concrete strategies for challenging and transforming the social norms that can stand in the way of progress. Thank you immensely, Pia, for your profound remarks. They have served as a perfect introduction to our second panel. I will now introduce our moderator, Mr. Vukasin Petrovic, who has dedicated his professional and academic career to promoting and protecting democracy, human rights, freedom of expression, and media. Mr. Petrovic has been at the forefront of responding to social and political challenges, supporting social change and reforms in countries affected by conflict, political transition, and authoritarian rule. Mr. Petrovic leads DTI strategy for promoting and protecting human rights and democracies, overseeing a portfolio of media, technology, and human rights programs. He also directs policy engagement with governments and multilateral institutions, such as the U.S. government or the European Commission. Um, I also want to extend a warm welcome to our esteemed panelists, who has generally, generously joined us to share their insights and expertise. Thank you so much, Mukasin. Thank you, uh, thank you, Alessandra. And as someone who, as Alessandra mentioned, has dedicated its career to protection and promotion of human rights, I have to say I am delighted to see us paying more attention to social norms. And if someone 10 years ago told me that we are going to have two panels back to back at the United Nations talking about social norms and its importance for democracy and sustainable development, I would not believe it. You know, and I have to say, I am proud that I was proven wrong. And more importantly, I am uh, proud that we have proven wrong so many people that encountered in the past that used to blame communities or social groups for not advocating for their rights because of the lack of perceived the lack of political will or perceived lack of demand for, for their rights. You know, and I'm happy to see that over the last 10 to 20 years, we as, as the community uh, have been on a journey to explore this system of unwritten rules and uh, realize and understand what and how we can support communities and how we can empower them, change perception about them and, their, and change perception, their perception of the world that, that surrounds them in order for them to be more advocate for their, for their rights. So questions such as how do social norms shape the creation of societies? How do norms around gender roles affect progress towards gender equality? And what tactics can we utilize to advance norms that champion inclusivity and sustainable growth has been on my mind and on our minds for all this time? And to help me this, uh, uh, answer these questions today, I'm joined by a group of extraordinary people who through their lives carried many different hats. They were activists, development professionals, academics, and policy makers. And it is my pleasure to introduce first uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Nancy O'Kali. Nancy is a renewed activist who paid a high price for her pursuit of justice and equality. As the director of the Freedom House in Egypt, she was one of NGO workers that was uh, convinced and sentenced to prison. Uh, after that, uh, 
Dr. Kali continued to work on human rights and governance issues across MENA region and uh, worldwide. And today, she's president and CEO of the Center for International Policy. And she's the first woman to lead CIP in its uh, 50 years history. In addition to Dr. Okali, it's also my pleasure to introduce uh, Ms. Mercedes Say. And Ms. Mercedes Say is a human rights leader from the Maya Kish Nation. She's a founding member of the National Council on Indigenous People in the Diaspora, and she has dedicated her life to, to protection of human rights of Indigenous people. In addition to Ms. Say and Ms. Okali, Christian Lamere is a senior program officer at UNDEF, and he brings us with us, uh, or he brings to us experience both as someone who has spent his career working for the UN in many different places, including very challenging places such as Afghanistan and Mali, but at the same time as someone who has worked on the other side of this, uh, I would say, uh, divide and has worked uh, for civil society organizations and international uh, NGOs on promoting elections and political processes in, in developing, uh, develop, at that time, developing countries. And finally, Ivan Marovic, who, is also, who was also one of the leaders of a social movement uh, back in the 90s that played a critical role in democratization of Serbia. And since then, Ivan Marovic has been advising numerous pro-democracy social movements around the world and became one of the leading educators in the field of strategic nonviolent action. And today, Ivan Marovic is executive director of International Center for Nonviolent Conflict. So, uh, to move on to the questions, uh, Nancy and Christian, I would like to pose you first a question and I would like you to uh, help me answer how essential are inclusive representation and diverse viewpoints in strengthening democratic systems and sustainable development. Thank you, Vuk, and thank you so much for having me today speaking about this very timely and important topic, and certainly not a new one. Um, so, I'm, I think I'm going to start by identifying why the issue of inclusivity and diversity is crucial for stability, security, and peace and justice. Uh, and not from a rights-based perspective, because if you have been paying attention to Washington DC and also other capitals in the world, the, the fashionable word these days is realpolitik. So I'm gonna play with that and see, not just because it's a, like people's rights uh, to participate and be part of the policies that are shaping and influencing their lives, but also looking at it from a very pragmatic uh, and uh, an effective way. Way. The fact that we have exclusionary spaces in policymakers, in policymaking, especially when it comes to issues related to SDG 16, it means that we are always going to have a partial view of reality. So when we're talking about realpolitik, the reality we're talking about, if reached through exclusionary spaces, it will always be partial. And we, when we have partial view, we have inadequate analysis, and we end up with solutions that are not effective because they are not adequate and they're flawed. So this is the first one. Second, the inclusion of various stakeholders in the process of forming policy, whether we're talking on a multilateral level or the UN, or we're talking on the level of a local council, participation guarantees sustainability of the policies that we promote. People have a stake and have the interest to maintain and sustain those policies. And finally, if we are looking at change and always struggling on why change is not happening, it's basically common sense. If you expect that the same people who are sitting at the table forging those policies are the ones who are going to participate in, in exclusionary space making those policies, you cannot expect any change. Now, none of this is new. Everything I just said, you've heard it several times before, many, many types of arguments and, and approaches. 
Uh, and there were a lot of attempts to change that. But the question is, I mean, why after all those years and why after all those debates and arguments and evidence, things are not changing? I think I have a few issues just to share briefly. And I think the reasons could be seen as issues of misassumptions and designs. And because these issues have been recognized are crucial for a very long time, programs were forged for that. And this is when I start to worry. Once we turn in an issue on a problem into a program, although this seems a progress, there is more often than not the risk of falling into a reductionist way of looking at things. And I worry even more when that program turns to be an acronym, like DAI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, because it kind of over time turn it into a process or, 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 or a way of dealing with the challenges that we're having without actually addressing the root causes. And the first one relates to social norms. If we assume that we can have um, a structure or a particular space that we try to implement DEI programs and others, uh, and that immediately would change how things go. It's an illusion because this space is part of the, the bigger, larger society. And if there are no changes in the larger society, then we cannot think that we're gonna parachute people into a space that looks and, and feels different, but it's coming from and, and is seated within a society that has all those problems. And that's why we cannot talk about SDG 16 without SG, uh, SDG 5 and 10. And the previous panels have talked extensively and impressively about how this is important. The second issue and the second misassumption is that when you bring marginalized group into the space and put them in positions of power, that those are going to be just and, uh, and fair to other similar uh, and fellow uh, marginalized group. If you bring the woman, she's gonna be just and fair to other women in the space. If you bring the person of color, he's gonna be just and fair to the person in that space. This is a myth. Because if you bring those in the same and very structure that is unfair, we cannot expect that there will be change. And the, the other misassumption is that just because you have those people in the room, it means that there's progress there and there's inclusivity. Because, I mean, I think Emilia alluded to that in the previous panel, is that which women and which people of color who come and sit in that space. I mean, in Egypt, for example, I mean, the current regime pride itself of the number of women who are in the cabinet or, or in like uh, different council and the parliament, but which women? Those are the women who are close to the power circle, who advocate and stand by and maintain the very unjust system of that space. Because the problem starts with the last or like the, the the, the main point of, uh, of the bottom of like those assumptions and their problems is that if you bring people into a structure without changing them, they, and they are coming from a, a, a marginalized group or a disprivileged place, they will do their best to fit in. They will do their best to make sure that they are like everyone else and without noticing would be per perpetuating the very system that we need to change. And this gets, I mean, featured or, or, or we, we can see it in how all those processes turn into tokenization. Let's have the panel that have a woman, let's have the one that has a person of color, uh, and that becomes a way of like such tokenization, legitimizes a space that is still unequal. And this is why we find it hard, despite the recognition of the problems of exclusionary policies, exclusionary space for women, for people of color, for I mean, people from gender backgrounds, 
uh, and, um, and, and different affiliation as well. These are the things that leading to the frustration that we see today because we don't really change the structure. And, and again, like we cannot do that without looking at the connection between SDG 16 and number five and number 10 because they are closely associated. When we look at those spaces, the idea of elite capture is not just having elites in the room. I mean, I think the most dangerous process of elite capture is the co-optation of people from outside the elite and make them fit in, in this elitist space. So I think in order to be serious about those issues, we need to go back and look at all those misassumptions and understand the difference between an invited space and a acclaimed space. And as also Regina alluded to in the, in the previous um, panel, is that without having the safeguards and legislations and processes in place to make sure that people who come from a marginalized uh, group or, or a space that are, they're, not, they're from the minority, do not just hit a wall every time or just go without making any change. We have to make those structural changes fundamental. And finally, just to give you like an analogy of that, it's like a university claiming in its application that we welcome all people from all different backgrounds and including people with disabilities, but they don't have an elevator. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, Nancy. Uh, Christian? Uh, thank you, Vukasin. Um, for those who uh, do not know the, the UN Democracy Fund, there's a slide behind me, or to my left, to my left, that will give you some facts and figures. This way you will know us and might prompt some questions later. Um, it is a privilege to be here today. Uh, International Day of Democracy has always been our, our main event. Uh, for the UN Democracy Fund uh, in, a, in a given year. Um, and the gathering today is a testament of, I think, our shared commitment uh, to the ideals of democracy and inclusion. Um, I'm gonna ask a question to start. What is democracy? And it's not just rhetorical, I, I would like to have an answer. Will someone answer the question? We're all like professionals, you know, committed. We work in the democracy world. We advocate, yes. Simple, in a few simple words. Like maybe three words. Um, Can, Sorry, I need some help here. I didn't know that they would not work. Oh. Yeah, the, the one next to you works. Sorry for taking so much time with this. I think it's important. Oh, it's not on. Okay, there we go. Um, I'm going to give it a shot. Uh, my name is Vivian. I think democracy means uh, ability to govern one's affairs. Okay. Yes. Ability of a, like a community or a group of people to govern their own affairs. Yes. So you're talking about the people, right? Yes. So. Democracy means power to the people, from the Greek. And not just the power of certain individuals in a country or in a community uh, in this world. Um, it, uh, it means that all people should be included in governance. Um, many in this world think that uh, a clan or a tribe or money should be the model of governance for a few. But this is totally opposite to the ideal of democracy, uh, which is to empower everyone, he or she, or them, or they, nowadays. Um, so the UN Democracy Fund, since its creation, has worked with CSOs to uplift marginalized communities and minority groups uh, to give them a voice um, we promote the right to participate 
in democratic processes, and obviously to work towards the achievement of the SDGs. And I've heard a lot about goal 16, goal 10, goal 5. We work at this intersection. Although I'll give you a few examples later of other goals we were touching, we're working on through our projects. Um, UNDEF is a grant-making machine. Uh, we're not normative. We don't uh, work on policies. We don't, uh, you know, make big events where we can comment on the state of democracy. But we showcase our achievements, notable achievements, small ones in the world. Um, and to come back to the, to, to, to the main question, how essential is inclusive representation? Um, I will give you some examples, but globally, and I've heard this from everyone today around uh, in this panel, in the previous panel. Um, first, how essential? Obviously, it is essential. Now, key ways, why? Well, inclusive representation reflects the plurality of, of our societies, and they are more and more diverse than they were 50 or 100 years ago. People have different background beliefs and experiences, and um, they want to, as well, see themselves in the government, be heard. Um, inclusive representation prevents exclusions and uh, marginalization of my minority voices. It enhances legitimacy of democratic institutions. And um, I've heard this as well before, it's very important that diverse viewpoints, they make for a robust and well-rounded decision-making process. Without consultation, it's the, the rule of a few. A few examples now. I like to give examples. Um, in Jordan, uh, we've had a project, um, it's a, an organization that works on pro bono assistance in the legal, uh, in legal system, and um, they were empowering a group that is self-created, right? Detainees. They, they're not born detainees, but they become detainees. But this is a very specific group that, in many, many, many countries of this world, lose every rights they have, if they had any in the first place, when they become detainees. So um, the organization GCLA in Jordan uh, work on a pro bono assistance program for detainees. And um, it was very successful, and the government bought in, and they wanted to nationalize the system, make a, make, make a program out of it for the entire country. The project was able to not just raise awareness, but to advocate for the deta detainees, enter into discussion, created a dialogue with the authorities, not just the government, but also those who implement the laws, police, for, for one, and the, go the government bought in. Uh, in the Balkans, another very interesting project that aimed to empower uh, grassroots Romani organizations, um, not just to let them advocate for their rights, but to let them participate in the development of policies and laws uh, that affect them. In Lebanon, we have a project currently running where they're trying to improve the implementation of laws against gender-based violence. Again, and you're gonna hear me talk about this and talk about this and talk about this. There's collaboration among CSOs who are creating, um, I would say, coalitions of not just CSOs, but as well political movement, political, uh, political uh, parties to advocate together. And obviously they work with implementers, judges, and internal security forces. One of the things we've realized over the years at the fund is that if you work on um, on countering a social norm, or making evolve a discussion about a social norm that affects and excludes a specific group in society, 
is that you can do a lot of capacity building, can raise a lot of awareness. You can advocate to a population or to a group that's already convinced. But you need to enter a dialogue with the government or the authorities or the local uh, municipality. Okay? And um, so buzzwords, I've heard buzzwords before and I, I like it. So the buzzword here is, yes, advocacy, but dialogue. And dialogue just not among a community that is committed to the cause, but also with those who have different ideas. And obviously the government sometimes doesn't share the same ideas. But there can be buy-in and it can work out. And I'll come back later for the next question with more examples. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Christian. So, Mercedes, please, uh, I would kindly ask you if you can now, you know, do a deeper dive into how do these restrictive social norms around marginalized groups and gender roles affect progress towards equality? speaker is uh, using an indigenous language. Good morning to uh, everyone. My name is Mercedes. Uh, thank you for inviting me. It's, I'm happy to be here with you this morning. I was interested in the term that you just, uh, that you just used when you speak of what is democracy. We have a, a wonderful concept on paper. We can read it, the democracy, we can say, state it, but what's interesting is how, how we interpret democracy from each perspective, from each point of view. When, the, when there's a debate on democracy and the inclusion of women, well, to, to hear the the concept that historically women have uh, been excluded from political systems, uh, from the decision uh, community decision-making systems, then we cannot include the word democracy because that means that there's no there's n uh, there's no harmony between what is on paper and what we are practicing. It's not they're not in sync. So to speak of democracy for us, for the indigenous peoples, is much more complex, complicated, because historically we have been excluded from all systems that are part of so-called democracy. To be a woman and to be an indigenous woman is a triple effort to try to uh, uh, enter into a decision-making process because... Because they believe, people believe that in addition to, to being a woman, we're incapable in, in of deciding. When minority groups, and I'm thinking of indigenous peoples, within those groups, women have been, have, have played the most important role in protecting our natural resources in our communities, and even globally, I have to say. Wherever there are women, and strong, resilient women, there are uh, sound, strong uh, social structures. Unfortunately, we're not we're not given an opportunity to to uh, take part in the political decision making process in uh, in order to improve our living conditions. And I'm not only talking about women, but but I'm talking about communities and uh, other minorities, such as the LGBT uh, uh, min minority. The issue, the topic of democracy, in addition to depending on the dominant sector uh, for, for the decision-making in our country, for, 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 for some, democracy can mean just the freedom to move around, but not to express ourselves. So, historically, the topic of exclusion is very broad, of major, of large minorities, actually. 
and we, we're simply not, and we're still there for de, for developed countries. We we applaud the the support that uh, they provide to developing countries to try to help us uh, improve in education, training, and 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 offer offering opportunities to to promote democracy. How I think that one of the very important aspects that we need to take into account is that those who are who are here in this room uh, in our own uh, societies we can promote we can we can we can uh, do something positive uh, because uh, our our historical memory is changing it's the only way of moving forward in our in our fight stereotypes and prejudices have also meant that this within the states there's a there's a uh, lack of certainty uh, cultural exclusion and gender norms have been factors that have limited uh, democracy within our country sometimes social conditions and class conditions have meant that democracy uh, seen differently from different points of views in different uh, groups as as original as as indigenous peoples we have the opportunity of having community organizations that have certain values and promote certain values that have to do with harmony this has enabled us to survive and subsist in spite of the assaults that we have uh, suffered that are promoted by the democratic elites uh, with unfortunately based on ideological blinkers and a and and a, a democracy should be based on consensus so that our rights as men women c communities minorities should be included within the system thank you thank you so much even <clears throat> and uh, similar question uh, I would like to pose a similar question to you as someone who had a chance to work uh, over the years uh, in uh, dozens and dozens of countries with marginalized communities. Uh, so how do you see these restrictive norms you know, that uh, prevent, uh, prevent uh, equality and prevent full participation of marginalized communities in democracy and development? Thank you, Vukashin. And it's an honor to be here today uh, and uh, to kind of connect the uh, International Democracy Day with the, the two previous uh, 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 statements. First, Christian posing the, the, the question, what is democracy? And from that aspirational uh, point of view, like we want to see the power and decision-making in the hands of the many, not the few. But then contrasting that to what Mercedes shared with us, how actually there are many uh, obstacles to achieving that. And so I would like to add, uh, in my uh, experience from the last uh, almost two decades, uh, yes, there is uh, democracy in its um, normative and its institutional form, but also there is another form of democracy, and that is how people practice it. And this is in the form of social movements. And in my organization, International Center on Nonviolent Conflict, we dedicated the last uh, more than two decades trying to understand this phenomenon and trying to kind of do not just research, but also documentation and sharing of lessons learned of how people uh, engage in, in, in social movements. And social movements being the vehicle for ordinary people uh, to practice politics. And uh, yes, we know uh, that, uh, you know, the, uh, how should I say, social movements do have political impact, they do have a social impact, they result in uh, legislative and, 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 and uh, normative changes, but also they uh, present, and this is why it's important to the question that you posed, Vukashin, they, they present an opportunity for societies to change social norms. And we can say that movements, uh, uh, first achieve in changing uh, the behavior of people, they participating in the movement, they're being moved by those movements, and they change their behavior, they change their beliefs, they change their attitudes, and 
they change their social norms. So in a sense, that creates then a climate that is more positive for normative changes that are going to take place in parliaments and they're going to be followed by you know, greater representation uh, and, and uh, how shall I say, participation of marginalized groups. And so I will just give uh, a couple of examples and then, and then uh, uh, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll touch upon those uh, in greater detail, but, but uh, in our uh, work, in our investigation and documentation, you know, we can see that, for instance, the movements such as, let's say, to take an example, a movement that originated in Argentina, Marea Verde, uh, which actually totally changed the way people perceive abortion in, not just in Argentina, but it actually spread all over Latin America. It is actually an important uh, example how a social movement can challenge the existing social norms and help society look at the a particular, uh, how shall I say, social problem or a, or a social challenge in a different way. Uh, another, another one, another example that I will use tomorrow is going to be a one year anniversary of the death of Maksa Amini in Iran and the consequent uh, movement, uh, Women Life Freedom, that emerged in that country that challenged the repressive uh, uh, practices and social norms. This is something that is unprecedented, never before seen in, 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 in Iran. It, it, it kind of dwarfs all the other mobilization efforts that, 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 that were happening before. And then finally, you know, and, uh, the third example that I will use is uh, not as dramatic, but I think it's, it's, it's very important. In um, two years ago, in the elections in, in Zambia, uh, which were supposed to be just any elections that, that, that were happening in that country, but what happened was that the emergence of a social movement that focused on mobilizing youth and uh, to not just vote in, in the election, and that resulted in a 70% youth turnout, but also to vie for election, to kind of create uh, the opportunities for young people to become candidates and to win uh, uh, some of the races, both on national level and local level, actually resulted in the changed behaviors uh, of, uh, and attitudes of people towards youth representation. So in a sense, we can see how social movements can actually use the existing norms and at the same time challenge the existing norms and transform them for greater representation. Lovely, Ivan, thank you so much. Um, and I, I know that we have approximately 20 more minutes and I know that uh, you folks have 3,799 questions that you would like to ask us, but I also have a couple of more burning questions for, uh, for uh, our panelists. So Nancy and Mercedes, so, uh, two questions for you, uh, Nancy, first. So what is that that we can do to empower these marginalized communities to capture these spaces? You know, so that once when they're in a position to make the, the difference and to challenge and introduce new, new norms, that they actually do that. And then the second question is, what is that that we can do when it comes to the public and social norms that, uh, that uh, uh, in a way encourage public to dismiss uh, women and marginalized communities as incapable. So what we can do about also changing that, that uh, th those uh, restrictive social norms that prevent women and marginalized communities from actually uh, being equal participants? Thank you. Um, I think the first um, thing that comes to mind and the most important one, I believe, is to stand away from the issue of essentialization. Uh, essentialization of societies and promoting that or instilling this kind of essentialization under the euphemism of respecting traditions and special cultures. Uh, or 
stating that these communities, they're conservative by nature, women are not allowed or by their religion or whatever uh, to go outside of their norms, so we have to respect it. No, there is a huge difference between paying respect and maintaining repression. And paying respect actually means that you strive and, and, and struggle to give people choices so that it does not become and impose structure or impose barriers on those people. A lot of people, particularly in Western communities, mix between the idea of respecting culture and essentialization. And essentialization is hugely uh, dangerous and it is a big hindrance for change. And the other issue with your, related to the second question, which is not so far from that, that as I said, like in my first comments, you cannot expect that you can create a space that has certain uh, inclusivity of it within a larger community that it's not. And in order to change uh, like the structures and inequalities outside of that space and, and, and the society at large, you have to speak to people in a language they understand. Our language is mostly, and I'm being self-critical here, is elitist, uh, it's expert heavy, and it does not reach the people. And without access to information, and access here, I don't mean that the information is made public. I mean the information becomes accessible so that people understand what is the problem, why we need to tackle it, and why is it relevant to them in the first place? Why do I care that women would be in a position of power? How would that affect me? When they actually people have this recognition in a way that is effective because most of the work of advocacy, and again, like I'm being self-critical here in our work, there's an underlying assumption of if only people knew if people knew that FGM is harmful, they're going to stop it. Uh, no, it doesn't work this way. It works on heavy and long investments in people understanding and knowing how, why, first, yes, it's important if only people knew, but also understanding that it is not just the knowledge, but also the support for structural change that enables people to instead of taking risks of getting out of the norms, working with others to change them. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Nancy. So, Mercedes, very similar question to you. What we can do to change the norms that encourage public to dismiss indigenous people and the indigenous women as incapable of participating in democracy and development? Bueno, if I think that uh, it's a very complex problem. We have had more than 500 years uh, during which we have been struggling for our rights as indigenous peoples. Uh, apart from being a significant group of women, it's worth pointing out that molding norms and social forces requires a great deal of effort. It requires coordinated effort. And we can achieve this if the institutions and civil society organizations and individuals themselves, if we uh, together start understanding that we are part of a society uh, when we were born, we were not classified uh, as being part of a particular group, as belonging to any uh, particular group. We must recognize that we are first and foremost all human beings. We have our own ways of living, uh, ways of organizing. And also, we are part of our ancestors who started building a society, one that was harmonious with nature and then with uh, the environment. I don't think that it is a secret uh, to say uh, to anyone that uh, since the beginning of uh, colonization of these territories in the beginning of colonialism, that is when 
uh, the, the deterioration of this society began and where we enter into this uh, class-based system that seems to set the rules. And yet we say that we are part of democracy, but within our concept of democracy, saying that an indigenous woman is not able or is unable uh, to speak speak uh, with wisdom or that we're unable to speak a language, all of this makes us different, but it doesn't make us less intelligent. So I think it depend, depends on us as a society and as individuals to start creating, to start changing the way we have been thinking about this within our states and uh, within our different uh, types of policies. It's unfortunate to see that sometimes on panels uh, like this, as uh, my esteemed colleague said just a few moments ago, it's unfortunate that we uh, hear about uh, elitism in uh, language and we don't really meet this uh, cultural relevance independently of whether or not we are indigenous or not. We all have a cultural belonging as people and so why do we not enter into these relevant dialogues as individuals, as people, as uh, parts of a world that have to live together? We have to share the world without uh, discrimination and without uh, uh, stigmatised classes. Uh, there is uh, a, a very long way still to go, but I do believe that if we are united, we can find the way and we can get there, because... We are protectors of Mother Earth and we complement one another. Uh, capitalism can help uh, entrepreneurs and uh, people from the world of academia. Why, do not we, why don't we work together and build something uh, to make this world change for the better? Uh, we have seen that the breakdown of social tissue, social fabric is causing huge fault lines to arrive rise in our societies. We're talking about uh, issues like artificial intelligence, about technological progress. But when are we going to talk about the progress of family and family integration? If a family is whole, uh, then society will also be whole. If all of the members of a society are united, uh, then uh, things can be achieved together. The social fabric is absolutely crucial to move beyond the stereotypes that we have created as a society. Mercedes, thank you. Th thank you very much. And uh, something that you mentioned resonates uh, very much with me, and uh, even uh, this is something that uh, you were also talking about uh, during uh, your previous uh, contribution, F fault lines. And the fact that you know we are seeing uh, within all our societies, including democratic societies, uh, uh, these fault lines appearing very much when it comes to how establishment or elites see social movements, and that activism is increasingly seen as something dirty, and that social movements and civil society organizations are increasingly portrayed and seen by public as the enemies of the state and enemies of the people. So what is that that we can do to start challenging these social norms and start changing these social norms so that social movements operate in more enabling environment? This is true. The, uh, being an activist today is not an easy <laughs> task. And, and yes, uh, public perceptions are, are rather negative about uh, uh, activism and about uh, movements in general. Uh, but I would say that this is not... Uh, an organic social norm. This is pretty much a result of those same elites that you mentioned that are constantly pushing that narrative and actually engaged in some sort of like a information war against their own population and especially against people who are trying to change things in those countries for the better. So in a sense, if we acknowledge that those negative stereotypes towards activism are not genuine but rather produced, as a, this is kind of an important first step. But I think to counter that, it is really important to offer uh, an opportunity 
for uh, people, marginalized groups, especially like young people, to engage in activism and to kind of, uh, 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 kind of participate in politics in that active way. So we, in the previous panel, like one of the uh, uh, contributions from the audience was mentioning of civics. But I think, you know, together with civics, there is an importance to kind of help young people learn the practicalities of activism. How do we campaign? How do we change people's behaviors? How do we change people's attitudes? Like those organizational skills are also very important. Just to give you an example, or actually refer back to the one that I uh, mentioned before, in Zambia, uh, a group that was part of that youth campaign called Girls Gone Political, their effort was to encourage young women to become candidates for office. And they provided them with support because it was really against the culture, against the grain to run for office as a young woman. But they provided that support network and they also provided very specific support in running their campaigns, in uh, creating those campaign teams and helping some of these young women win, uh, especially in the local elections. So it says that kind of support mechanism that is very practical actually then encourages young people and others to actually become activists. Lovely, Ivan. Thank you, thank you so much. And uh, Christian, uh, now going back again from you know conversation about uh, social movements and how we can change norms around uh, social so, uh, social movements, I want to go back to discussion about the democratic institutions and wanted to ask you how we can tailor better democratic institutions and governance mechanisms to address these concerns of marginalized group and become more inclusive. Thank you, Vukasin. Um, I, think there, I think there's a few fundamentals, and uh, they've been mentioned a few times already. Uh, so I'm just gonna reiterate, and then give, give you a few examples on how things can be done. First, diverse representation of minority groups, of all type of minority groups, either indigenous or based on belief or gender. Um, having inclusive policies uh, that address the needs of marginalized communities and vulnerable groups in healthcare, education, economic empowerment, like across the board. Uh, the effective participation of minor minority groups in decision-making processes. I've talked about this before. Um, my colleague panelist uh, mentioned access earlier. Access to information, access to justice. And also, uh, and this is what we strive for at the, at the fund, uh, is a focused capacity building of CSOs and empowering them to support those groups that need recognition, that need to advocate for their rights. In terms of diverse representation, um, talking about indigenous or vulnerable minorities in a country, we've, we funded a project in Somalia where we have uh, young fellows uh, working in government offices. And those fellows are coming from minority groups. Somalia is very uh, tribal, clan-based. And um, this is the first time ever something like this is done, uh, following a, a first, there, were, there was a first uh, initiative before. Um, but this, this, this one uh, really manages to uh, give us the space to different minority groups, I would not get this space uh, anyway if they were recruited through the normal system, right? In uh, terms of inclusive policies um, in Lebanon, um, we have a project uh, that aims at confronting injustices in housing and land rights. I said earlier that the UN Democracy Fund works at the intersection of Goal 16, Goal 10, Goal 5, but we work across all the goals. They're all interlinked, right? So this one focuses on SDG 11. Um, and besides reporting on housing, housing rights violations and injustices and having legal assistance, here again, they engage, they create a dialogue with the government, they make recommendations, okay, to create a change, to create a positive change. 
Hold on, do I have? You have two more minutes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> in terms of access to information in Zimbabwe, um, and I, I could say it's not the only project we've had about community radios, uh, which is often in, in many parts of the world the, the best way to communicate um, for uh, minorities that r live and work in the rural areas. Um, in Zimbabwe, uh, we've had uh, we, this project where uh, the government has uh, made a commitment and to honor a commitment on licensing community radios because this was a problem before, which opens up the space for information. We're talking about information before to be available. Um, this way, marginalized communities can access information and as all well speak their language and speak about their concerns. On the focus capacity building of CSOs, and I'm going to end with this example because it's going to bring me to make a little announcement. Uh, <laughs> um, in, 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 uh, in Zambia, we, we have this project uh, where we, uh, it's a capacity building project uh, where CSOs work with subsistence, subsistence farmers, rural women groups, and uh, young people um, to advocate for climate action. And this is a new trend right now, and obviously the world is all about climate action and uh, just for, for, for just reasons. Um, and uh, just to follow up on this, we're going to have an event later on today that talks about youth democracy and climate action. Thank you. Sure. Christian, thank you. Thank you very much. Mercedes Ivan, thank you very much. And thank you all very much for giving us an opportunity to talk uh, one more time today about social norms, democracy, and inclusive development. Thank you. Thank you to all our panelists and the participants for engaging in such a thought-provoking discussion. Your insights have enriched our understanding of how values, social norm, and democracy intersect. As we approach the conclusion of the event, we have one last lighting talk. Ms. Rosalie Basket Theater, the co-executive director of our partner, Partners Global, will provide remarks that encapsulate our discussions today. Partners Global is the founder and coordinator of a network of peace and democracy NGOs in 21 countries. We use inclusive processes to promote neutral power dynamics and authentic partnerships. It sounds simple, but in practice, it's an ongoing learning process, complicated by unrealistic timelines, competing priorities, and different levels of competing resources. So how do we avoid patterns of top-down and extractive development? The Partners Network has been experimenting with this challenge for more than 30 years. Our network was founded in 1989 during the fall of communism, during the revolutionary wave of liberal democracy that was occurring in the former Soviet bloc. The international community at that time rallied to promote democratic values and principles that would help civil society to function and actually to be created in the first place. At that time, partners, then called Partners for Democratic Change, raised funds to promote peace entrepreneurs. These individuals would get seed funding, they would receive peace building methodology support, and organizational management skills so that they could launch their own peace centers and we would be there to help communicate and navigate the complex transition. Ironically, 30 years later, our network is experiencing a new dangerous set of restrictive policies, programs, and regimes putting NGOs and democracies at greater risk than even before. I won't be discussing our peace building work today. Instead, I wanted to emphasize the inclusive processes within which all types of development programming should be booking in the face of fragmented civic space. So first, let me take a minute to ask you to reflect on the definition of inclusive democracy. At its most basic level, inclusive democracy is the equal distribution of power at all levels. It's important to ask ourselves if the distribution of power is level in each step of our development programs. Design, implementation, adaptation, and evaluation. This basic awareness of power dynamics can have a huge impact on our achievement of inclusion as a necessary and valid component of sustainability and democratic change. 
Through an external evaluation of the first 25 years of Partners Global's work, we were able to extract examples of inclusive practices that improved our programs and allowed us to help integrate SDGs 16, 10, and 5 in particular. We also identified which approaches were counterproductive and disempowering. I will now share the three examples of what not to do first. Number one, avoid confusing participation with inclusion. Partners and vulnerable groups can be invited to events to sit at the table, but that does not reflect an inclusive approach in and of itself. You have to ask yourself, were those individuals involved in the design of the agenda? Were they given an opportunity to lead a discussion, not just provide testimony of the challenges that they face? Were they invited to assess the impact of the activity and the achievement of the indicators? If not, then it's likely that inclusion wasn't achieved. Number two, avoid at all costs speaking on behalf of marginalized collaborators. They can speak for themselves. When planning activities, we should always ask ourselves, where are our colleagues from differently abled groups? Look at who's sitting next to you today. Look around the room. Who is missing or who is underrepresented? And at times, you can't tell because there are other types of differences in our abilities. So keep that in mind when planning your next meeting or event. We have to challenge ourselves to keep these questions at the forefront of our planning in order to normalize what is an authentically inclusive approach. And number three, do not pretend that there is no power to equilibrium in your partnerships. In development assistance, if one side is bringing in resources and the other is receiving, there's always a power dynamic at play. The only way to diffuse it or to reduce its impact is to acknowledge that it exists and to have a joint plan on how to minimize the negative impact requiring a great deal of trust and transparency. So take a moment now to reflect on what partnerships you're involved in, which side in the position has greater power? Which side of that power are you on? And what can be done to improve this dynamic? Okay, that was a summary of a few of the practices to avoid. Now we'll focus on the positive. Number one, do ensure that your activities are culturally and linguistically appropriate. One of the struggles we often have in localization is that many concepts and approaches are not conveyed in all languages. This is because language is a reflection of culture. Sometimes the reason we can't say something in a language or we need a more flexible design is not due to language constraints themselves, but rather because of differences in culture that are hard coded in human behavior and are only reflected and visible in the language that we choose. So if local partners are approached as equals in the design phase, cultural and linguistic validity will more likely be achieved. This increases trust and local buy-in from all stakeholders and more than likely will have a positive effect on your sustainability goals. Number two, do ensure equal access to opportunities and resources for people who might otherwise not be included. This includes those who have physical or mental challenges and members of minority groups. Access to knowledge and tools equals power. And in a world where technology is being used to perpetuate digital insecurity, it is imperative for the most vulnerable to receive tailored support and protections in this area. Number three, do ensure that your teams are trained in conflict sensitivity. The ability to identify conflict drivers, de-escalate tensions, and reduce the potential to cause unintended harm to communities is a vital skill set for NGOs, irrespective of what sector that they work in. During the time of rising polarization, our network colleagues have identified this technical area as an essential capacity for all of their teams. This has been a small sample of the feedback we've collected. Additional findings were analyzed along with responses from over 50 NGOs and other stakeholders around the world who shared their views on sustainability with us. We've incorporated these resources into an approach called the Resiliency Plus Framework. You can see that on your screen now. The achievement of the sustainable development goals isn't taking place in a static environment. It's a complex and often volatile ecosystem that will require resilient organizations and authentic partnerships. Let's all make a shared commitment to explore our own organizational practices and approaches and identify where we can improve our systems and processes to make this a more democratic, inclusive, and resilient sector. Thank you. And now, last but certainly not least, we are deeply honored and humbled to have former Prime Minister of Canada and member of the Club de Madrid, Ms. Kim Campbell, join us to deliver the closing remarks. 
Ms. Campbell is a former Prime Minister of Canada, and she served in 1993, becoming the first woman to hold the office. Previously, she has served as Minister of for Indian Affairs, Minister of Justice and Attorney General, Minister of National Defense, and Minister of Veterans Affairs. After becoming leader of the Progressive Conservatives and Prime Minister, she implemented radical changes to the structure of the government. This included the redesign of eight ministries and the abolition or merging of 15 others. Additionally, Ms. Campbell consolidated more services for the Canadian people by creating three new ministries, health, Canadian heritage, and public security. Throughout her career, Ms. Campbell has been deeply engaged in international issues, including law reform, criminal justice, international trade, and security. Ms. Campbell, it's an honor. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. Um, I came, I, I wanted to sit through all of the panels today and they were absolutely excellent and I thought that I would be able to do an easy reprise of the main points made, but unless we are prepared to spend uh, the weekend together, I can't do that. So let me just uh, use the few moments that I have to tell you, first of all, uh, what I'm doing here. I'm actually in New York because yesterday I participated as a member of a global commission on climate overshoot and we uh, presented our report and had our, our, our press conference. And my colleagues at the Club de Madrid, of which I'm a, a founding member, said, well, you're in New York, would you like to participate in this wonderful democracy uh, uh, event at the UN? And uh, particularly because partnering with International IDEA, which has been a, a partner of the Club of Madrid since it was founded. I was very happy to do this, and, and I'm very, very pleased. And actually, I think I once did some things with the International Center for the Study for, for Nonviolent Conflict. So uh, many of the, uh, my, my past is coming back to me here of all these wonderful people uh, involved in, in organizations that have been important to me. Um, Inclusion and barriers to democracy are really fundamental. The Club of Madrid, incidentally, was formed in 2002 after a conference in Madrid the previous fall on democratic transition and consolidation. And it brought together current and former democratic leaders. And there was such an interesting chemistry between the former leaders who weren't running for anything and could be very candid and open about the challenges that they faced, and the current leaders who were interested to meet people who had been there and done that and get their advice, that we thought there might be a purpose and a role for an organization that would bring together former democratically elected heads of state and government. And we started out with 34 uh, members and now have over 110, and it's the largest forum of former democratic presidents and prime ministers in the world. And when we were formed in 2002, we were celebrating what many people talked about, the third wave of democratic transition. As you may recall, some of you who are old enough, uh, how optimistic we felt and how wonderful it was to see countries of the former Soviet bloc working to create democratic governments. Uh, it was just, it was uh, wonderful changes in Latin America. It was really a very exciting time. But today, we're not feeling quite so optimistic. In the course of the Club of Madrid's development, we've tried to look at what are the challenges to democratic development, and one of our most important program is called the Shared Societies Program, and it's very much linked to your discussions today because, uh, as we identified, 90% of the countries of the world have minorities of at least 10%. And what we tried to do in our Shared Societies Program was to create a toolkit of things that could be done to help countries create truly democratic governance in the context of divided and varied and diverse societies. And many of the things we've talked about are things that you have raised today. There's been a lot of wisdom and, and, ex and experience. Uh, a number of years ago, I attended a meeting in The Hague which was involved in discussing whether the European Union should create uh, something like the National Endowment for Democracy, should it create a democracy promotion body. And although I once spoke to a group there and said, you know, you already are a democracy promotion body because the, uh, the process of acceding to your EU membership uh, accomplishes things that you know, voluntary political reform never could. Political reform is one of the hardest things even for mature democracies. But with the a key of policies that and, uh, countries need to adopt in order to have EU membership, they were able to leapfrog all of the, um, all, all of the arguments. My, my Club of Madrid colleague, Valdis Berkovs, who was Prime Minister of Latvia during that period of negotiation, said that his negotiators would come back from Brussels and they'd say, we have to do this because 
Brussels says we have to do it. And he would say, no, we need to do it because it's good for Latvia. But you'd never get it through Parliament just because it was good for Latvia. You really had to have that other carrot and stick. And so, in fact, EU membership turned out to be a very valuable uh, device for, uh, for helping uh, countries uh, move to democratic reform. But I remember in that meeting in The Hague, the late uh, uh, Ralph Derendorf, Lord Derendorf, gave opening remarks and he said the fundamental uh, characteristic of democracy or condition for democracy, for uh, apropos our discussion earlier, is not elections. They are a necessary but not sufficient condition. It is the rule of law. It is this notion that the, the, the law will, will, will protect and that we, you are governed by laws, not, not by people. But as we've also talked about today, the law is not distinct from social values. And those of us who have made the laws understand how much they are, in fact, a reflection of those who get to make them. And that is why this notion of inclusivity um, and, and, uh, and diversity for, for good decision making is so important. And in my own political career, I have learned so much from sitting down with people who were not at all like me and had totally different values. And I, they have kept me from making some really stupid mistakes. So um, it's a really important, uh, important uh, aspect. But it also means that the democratic narrative is essential. We all tell stories. And we all have stories of our countries. And sometimes those narratives are wonderful and sometimes they're very dangerous. I think about the indigenous people in my own country who would say, our exclusion from the narrative, I mean, there are good narratives. If you, you read about the role of First Nations women in helping to open up the West, they, they, they were a liaison often between the early fur traders, the Hudson's Bay Company people, and their own communities. They played remarkable roles. But the roles of so many people in our societies are not written into the narratives, are not written into the history. So one of the most important things we have to do, if we are committed to inclusion and, and the ability to achieve our goals by an inclusive embrace of every aspect of our society, is to ask what are the stories that we're telling? What are we saying about people? What do young children learn about certain members of the society? And that can be different ethnic groups, different groups of, of immigrants, indigenous people, et cetera, and particularly the gender differences. For women, myths and stereotypes have been a constant issue. Um, when I became Prime Minister of Canada, nobody who looked or sounded like me had ever done that job before. And I have to tell you that for the Ottawa Press Gallery, this was a serious um, uh, shock and, and, and difficulty because I just didn't look or sound like anybody who'd done that job. And so every time we, we, we broaden the net, every time we bring new and different people onto the landscape of who gets to make the decisions, we change people's sense of how the world works. Little children who grow up seeing a, a gender diverse, an ethnically diverse society, and people of all different colors, sizes, shapes, levels of ability, sexual orientation, playing important roles in their society have a very different view of how the world works than people who have a much narrower view. So we need to have the narratives that come from the landscape itself, from what people see, and the stories that we tell. I was telling somebody yesterday about uh, my own view uh, about how you, uh, my own narrative and my own understanding of, of the world has changed. I sometimes say my life has consisted of learning and unlearning many things. But may, most of you are probably not old enough to remember uh, when Title IX passed in the American Congress in 1972. And this was a law that said that if there were uh, programs funded by the federal government, they had to be equally available to men and women. And this included sports. And of course, that was a very shocking thing because many people said, well, girls don't want to be involved in sports as much as boys do. And, you know, isn't that how we, we keep men from becoming totally uncivilized? You know, we throw them into teams and they, they you know, work off their, <laughs> their energy. But what was, and, and I knew Birch Bayh, who was a senator, who was uh, part of the Congress that passed that legislation. And I remember later meeting him and saying, you know, I don't know if in 1972, I would have supported that because I might have assumed that there was more interest in athletics, you know, in colleges and schools among men than among women. But I would have been wrong because what was interesting is that once Title IX passed and all of a sudden there was funding for women's sports, out of the woodwork came all of these women who wanted to play on teams, who wanted to play in sports. And it was a very important lesson to me. You can't tell 
by what people, what people can do or what they want to do by what they are doing. Because what they are doing is what they're able to do, what their society lets them do. And when you take away those barriers, you suddenly discover people doing amazing things, whether it's people you know, becoming scientists or athletes or whatever, uh, where, where previously they hadn't been admitted into those, those circumstances. And so this sense of the narrative is so important. A number of years ago, the New York Times introduced a new feature in its obituary column called Overlooked No More, which, which presents uh, obituary articles about remarkable people who, because of their gender, because of their background or whatever, were not written about when they died. And you read some of these stories and you go, these are amazing people. Why don't I know about this person? And every time I read a story about an amazing woman, an amazing person of color, somebody who, whose story I didn't know, I feel cheated. I think I needed to grow up knowing that person. When I saw that film, Hidden Figures, about the three remarkable African-American mathematicians slash computer programmers who actually made NASA possible. If you haven't seen the movie, find it. I'm sure it can, you can find it online. But aside from it being a remarkable story I mean, and the, the incredible racial you know, prejudice that they dealt with, but these extraordinary women, one of them a mathematics prodigy, but I, I felt cheated. I said, I have been diminished growing up not knowing about that because not knowing those stories plays into my kind of lazy bigotry, my expectations that the world is as I see it, and we all have it, and when we understand we have it, we can struggle against it. And once we struggle against it, we start telling the narratives, then we begin to enshrine that inclusion in the law, in rights, in anti-discrimination, and we give people vehicles that they can use in a democratic society to protect their rights to be included. So, one of, so much of, of uh, populism, I think, is based on, is fueled by false narratives by people who tell exclusionary stories. I remember, you know, we just had the, the anniversary uh, of 9-11, which was a terrible thing. But I remember the, the Islamophobia that it engendered, and that it's a credit to, to President George W. Bush that he made an effort to avoid that and to try and make sure that this did not become an excuse to target uh, Islamic members of American society. But I remember I'd, I'd see people say, well, you know, what have, what have Muslims ever done? And I'd say, mm, uh, how about algebra? Uh, I mean, there is a whole culture and history and contribution that we don't know about. A woman called Noisa McSweeney has just published a book called The West, uh, a story in 14 biographies where she writes about people who were integral to the sense of, of what we call Western culture but we're, are not the traditional suspects. It wasn't just an unbroken line from classical Greek, Greece and Rome. There were so many people from around the world and so many different uh, types of people who contributed to what we think of as, as this Western culture, which is really not so West and maybe not always so cultured. So my last comment is that a number of people have said that democracy is not perfect. Uh, and incidentally, libraries are at the heart of this <laughs> uh, capacity to, 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 to steward and share knowledge. Uh, and whenever people are out burning books, you know that's a sign to, uh, to uh, get nervous. But democracy uh, is a blunt instrument. It's not a precision tool. It is something that has to constantly be fostered, developed, perfected, uh, improved. And it is fragile because its various very norms can be used to undermine it. And we see this happening where people use the institutions of democratic society often to pursue goals that are not very democratic. American democracy was a model because it was founded on a document that represented an idea. And I mean, people would, would, would aspire to have something so, so similar. And in Canada, when we created our own Charter of Rights and Freedoms, this was considered in our society an opportunity to have an actual constitutional document that would articulate our rights and give us an instrument against which we could, we could measure whether governments were observing those rights. But this week, Senator Mitt Romney, uh, announcing his retirement, said that many of his colleagues don't believe in the Constitution 
And this is a very worrisome thing. And it undermines, again, this notion that, that democratic values uh, can be under threat, that democracies need to be protected, that they are, they are a constant commitment that we all have to, have to observe. And that social values are essential because we see that where the values of inclusion are not present, people will try to undermine the democratic stru structures. In my own experience, I served at all three levels of government in Canada, and I strongly support the notion that local governments are very important, and often people's view about democracy depends on whether their potholes are getting filled or whether their schools are being properly run, and so all levels of government in a democracy are extremely important for its credibility. I dealt with many difficult legal issues, particularly as Minister of Justice when I dealt with issues like gun control and gay rights and, and uh, sexual assault. And I learned there what, what you've talked about is the importance of consulting. And in fact, one of my successors as Justice Minister was asked if she wanted to follow the Campbell mode of consultation, which went far beyond the usual suspects that a Justice Minister usually spoke to about legal, legal reform. And as I say, people taught me so much. Uh, but yesterday, I just want to, to, to finish by saying yesterday I was at the presentation of the, uh, our presentation of the Climate Overshoot Commission. And one of our recommendations is, of course, that fossil fuels have to be phased out. And we think it needs to be done in a differentiated way that the, the developed countries have to take the lead and do it. But after the, our discussion about all the things in our report, somebody said to me, do you think that democracies can phase out fossil fuels? Do you think a democratic politician could run on a platform of phasing out fossil fuels and be elected? And that was a very interesting question because what it says is that democracy is fa facing so many challenges that where there are vested interests and powerful financial interests and uh, people who do not want necessarily for governments to govern in the interests of everybody, that democratic politicians and policymakers really have their work cut out to, for them. So celebrating democracy today on International Democracy Day is such an important thing. And thank you for all of the wisdom and wonderful experience that our panelists have shared today. Thank you for remembering that we didn't get here by accident. Uh, a lot of people paid with blood, with reputation, with disappointment. Um, and, and dealing with oppression and discrimination to get us to a, a stage where we can sit in this wonderful room and talk about this great value. But I want to say it's an honor and a pleasure to have been here with you today to say to you that, that I, for one, um, uh, am, am committed to the fight and I know that there are so many people who are because without democracy, none of the challenges that we face in this world will be resolved. And so this has to be our life's work. Thank you very much. Due to the time, we need to release the interpreter, so now we will just have English. Uh, but thank you, Mrs. Campbell, for your inspiring closing remarks. They do encapsulate the significance of our discussions today and the imperative to continue our efforts to fortify democracy worldwide. So since it's 105, I just want to thank everyone for being here, for joining us for International Democracy Day. Goodbye and take care. Thank you.